Okay, members, you're all welcome to a meeting of the Justice Committee, and if you can do your needful with any electronic uh, devices. If there's any interests, uh, financial or otherwise, relevant to any of the business today, now's the time to uh, to declare it. Um, I'll just note my previous interest again around the personal injury duty rate at this stage of the meeting. If any other members need to speak, then we're good sure, to go. Can yes. I declare an interest, please, in item 8? Sure. Okay. Okay, well then we'll move on. Um, the oral evidence sessions member, if you're agreed, will re re be uh, reported by Hansard. There are no apologies, um, so we are joined by the Deputy Chair Linda Dillon, Doug Beatty, Sinead Bradley, Gemma Dolan, Emma Rogan and Rachel Woods via the Starley facility. Um, and there have been no delegation of votes. So item two is the draft uh, minutes of the meetings that were held on the 19th and the 21st of January. Pages three to four of the table pack are the draft minutes of the 19th. And if members are content that they're a true reflection, then I will sign them accordingly. Members agreed. 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 And uh, if members are content then with the minutes of the 21st of January as being accurate, likewise I'll sign them also. Members agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Some item uh, matters arising from them. The uh, Committee for Finance letter dated the 22nd of January. The Committee for Finance has written to all the statutory committees advising of its intention to coordinate responses from statutory committees on the draft budget 21-22 and has requested responses by the 12th of February. Now, it is for each um, committee to determine what it wishes to examine in relation to the budget. The Finance Committee has provided some suggested lines of scrutiny, um, which uh, will be helpful. Officials are going to be attending the meeting next week, and they will provide an oral briefing on the draft budget settlement uh, for the Department of Justice. As agreed at last week's meeting, the views of the Department's eight non-departmental public bodies on the likely implications, potential pressures uh, arising from the budget uh, and the views of the Police and the Policing Board on the PSNI budget allocations have been requested um, and uh, we should receive them on the 3rd of February in advance of our meeting next week. Uh, a draft committee response on the budget will then be prepared after the oral evidence session for consideration and agreement at our meeting on the 11th of February um, before submission to the Committee for Finance and the Minister for Justice. Another item uh, under matters arising, the Committee for Finance has forwarded a copy of correspondence that it has sent to the Executive Office seeking clarity on the level of funding for set-up costs and uh, or the actual payments to victims that is required for the Troubles Permanent Disablement Payment Scheme um, and what has been sought for the 21-22 year. Um, <coughs> members may wish to discuss this matter with the Department of Justice officials during next week's oral evidence session at uh, next week's meeting. So uh, members are asked just um, if we ask the Committee for Finance to provide the Committee with a copy of the response from the Executive Office whenever that becomes available. Can I raise something, Chair, on that point? Yes, Paul. I was on the Finance Committee, as was Gemma yesterday, uh, when we spoke to officials, uh, finance officials, uh, and it seems to be a case that the Finance Minister is going to go through what would be classed as a, an informal monitoring round to try and spend this money that's been carried over before it has to go back to the Treasury. The question I posed was, surely if either Executive Office or Justice Department, whoever is leading on this uh, pension scheme, surely if we're at a point where there's money going to be handed back to the Treasury, uh, it becomes Treasury money. And if it becomes Treasury money, why then, before we would hand that over, could we not use that money to fund the pension scheme? Now, I know there's a principled political argument as to who should fund it, and I agree that it should be the Majesty's Government. But in saying that, if it's Treasury money that we are handing back, surely then, rather than just handing back what could be up to 200, anything between 200 and 400 million, surely that would go some way to financing and furnishing the pensioners or the, the pension scheme. It won't be at all by the sounds of things, but it will certainly be a good percentage of it. And then argue the principled political argument as to who then fits the bill, fits the bill with regards to the rest of the money. 
and I, I believe then that would be Her Majesty's government. And, and I think why, why I'm raising it now and not waiting to next week is because if that informal monitoring round is taking place at the minute with the Finance Minister speaking to all the departments, really I think we should be asking the Justice Department to get their head round what a bid of that magnitude would look like and how they would, could actually get it on the ground to make it legal holding some of that money back this year to get it into our system without saying we need it for this and then not being able to administer it or have the capacity to spend it and then it would have to go back to Treasury anyway. So I think it's something that we should be pushing on to the Department now, uh, sooner rather than later, to make sure that, that the pension scheme is still very much in our minds. Thank you. Okay, well, I'm, I'm not sure of what processes there could be to kind of identify a quantum of money to seek to almost put it in like a trust fund or something to draw it down whenever then it would become necessary. I, I don't really know what the accounting rules and all of that would be, but I'm happy if the, the committee is content that we would um, write to the department um, just in addition then to the Committee for Finance, you know, asking what consideration is the Department of Justice given to trying to identify a way to secure funding for future pressures, and that could relate to this, for example. Um, so if, if, if members are content, we could ask that general question then of the Department of Justice around this issue. Thank you. Okay. Then item three, um, on matters arising, the Department has provided a response to the queries raised during the briefing on the January monitoring round position and the budget 21-22 in December, along with a copy of the monitoring round template submitted to the Department of Finance. The information can be found at pages 6 to 30 of the table pack. The Department has also advised that in response to a request from the Department of Finance for further bids for COVID-19 funding, it has put down a marker for potential costs relating to the Northern Ireland Courts and Tribunal Service. Other costs, such as a potential increase in police overtime costs, are being kept under review, but a bid is not required for this at this time. So members may wish to explore some of these issues further during the budget briefing session next week. Okay, so if members are happy, we'll move on to the first oral evidence session that we're having, item four. It's the reviews of the support services for both operational and retired prison officer staff. So we have the officials joining us via the Starley facility. And the relevant papers are at pages 19 to 169 of the meeting. And I'm hopefully going to be welcoming Ronnie Armour, Director General, and Brenda, Brendan Giffen, Head of uh, Strategy and Governance from the Northern Ireland Prison Service, to the meeting. And uh, the session will be recorded by Hansard and transcript published in due course. So, um, Ronnie, I am going to hand over to you to give us a, a brief overview of the key findings, and then we shall take some questions. Thank you, Ronnie. Thank you, uh, Mr Chairman. Uh, I'm grateful to have the opportunity to attend the committee today to uh, speak about the two reviews published by the Minister uh, on Monday of this week. Uh, I'm not proposing in my opening remarks to go through them in, in detail, uh, but I'm very happy to take questions on any specific issue. Um, I do want, though, today, uh, Chairman, to welcome both reports uh, and to echo the words of the Minister in thanking Siobhan Keating, Gillian Robinson, and Graham Walker for the excellent work that they have undertaken. Um, I hope the committee will agree that these are two uh, really good reports that will be really helpful to us. Uh, moving forward. Uh, I believe the reports clearly outline uh, what we must do if we are to achieve the level of support prison officers past and present truly deserve. Uh, the publication of these reports marked, I believe, a very good day for the Northern Ireland Prison Service, uh, and we look forward to implementing the recommendations in both reports in line with the timescales that are outlined uh, in the Minister's Action Plan. I think it's fair to say, uh, Chairman, that the reports have been well received right across uh, the prison service. I think they give recognition of the work that we've been trying to do, uh, and they also chart for us that course moving forward of what needs to be done. Uh, I'm certainly very committed to delivering the reports, and as you will know from the Minister's statement, she's asked me to lead um, a programme board 
uh, in order to ensure that we deliver uh, as quickly as we possibly uh, possibly can. Um, I am happy, Chairman, to take questions today on any specifics around the report. I know you've had an opportunity uh, to look at the recommendations over the past few days, and I'm happy to, to deal with that now. Okay. Well, thank you, Ronnie. Um, and obviously, with the the progress board being established that you're going to lead, um, and I note that all of the recommendations have been accepted by the prison service, um, and I welcome that uh, in terms of both reports. Um, and you, you'll take this forward by way of implementation. Um, who else is on the the implementation body of that that you're going to be leading, um, and at what stage would you hope to be able to crystallise the kind of financial resources? that are going to, to be needed to put into effect all of the recommendations? Well, I'll be, leading, I'll be meeting next week, Chairman, with the uh, senior leadership of uh, the prison service uh, and will be allocating responsibility to different directors and different governors to take forward specific uh, recommendations. Um, I will be doing that in consultation with, uh, if we take the, the current staff, with Gillian uh, and, and Siobhan, as you know, the Minister has asked them to, um, to work with us over the next number of months uh, in terms of evaluating our progress. So I've been already in discussions with both of them in relation to the action plan, uh, and I will be involving them moving forward. But initially, uh, it will be an internal group. We will obviously have to pull in, uh, pull in others across the organisation, uh, and indeed beyond that, in terms of some of the scoping work we need to do around the around the costing i'm i'm very hopeful chairman that we will have um some more detail for the committee on the on the costing required uh, hopefully before the end of this financial year um i mean sure the committee will will accept if you're looking at for example the report from retired officers uh, i mean we know that somewhere in the region of, of 1400 staff have retired over the past eight years or so uh, we're talking about many thousands when you go uh, back beyond that. So it is very difficult for us at this point to, to scope the scale uh, of, of what's going to be involved, particularly in providing uh, the, the service that Graham has recommended for the retired staff. Uh, but we will be working with PRRT to do that. Um, and I, what I can tell the committee at the moment, and, and you will know this, is I think we're talking significant sums of money, but, but I can't quantify it at this stage, but hopefully before the end of the financial year, we will have a, a better idea. And was there, was there any of the, the findings, Ronnie, that um, surprised you? you know, obviously, I've, I've had a chance to look through some of it, and it, you know, it, it speaks to areas where there needs to be changes and improvements. You know, from your perspective, was there anything in that that caused you concern you know, that hadn't been identified before and um, that recommendations are now being made that need to change? No, no I think, uh, Chairman, there's nothing in the report that, that jumped out at me uh, as, a, as a particular surprise. I mean, I think we, we have all known um, senior leadership within the organisation, the Justice Minister and the committee, we've all known uh, that, that there is work to be, the work to be done here. We have, over the past uh, three years, been trying to make progress uh, around our Prisons 2020 wellbeing work, and I'm, and I'm grateful that the report highlights that and, and does give us credit for that. Uh, but, but there's nothing that they're recommending uh, that, I'm, that I'm particularly uh, surprised about. I mean, my, my sense over the past six months, as, as Gillian and Siobhan have been doing their work, uh, my sense is that the issues being raised with them uh, were not new issues. I mean, indeed, a number of members of the committee have raised uh, a number of these issues before, and we've not been in a position, uh, I think, to take uh, this forward in the in the way that we now that we now can. Yeah, and that's I suppose I made that comment in the assembly that we, at least we now have a baseline, and and that's something that we can measure against uh, by way of the improvements that need to be made. So you know, I do welcome these reports. I think it, it identifies issues now which will be very helpful because you first need to identify things to seek to change them and then have the structures to, to hold people to account for all of that. And I do welcome the comments that have been made about you know the prison service 
your team wanting to do this in a very open, transparent way, and it's it's about trying to to get the best way forward, as opposed to being defensive, maybe of um, things that should have been different in the past. So, in that spirit, I do welcome the efforts that are being made. Um, in terms of the the retired officers, obviously it'll, it'll be important that you know the the PRRT is recalibrated, I suppose, somewhat, and and is able to provide the kind of support then that may well come forward and, and I accept that's difficult to quantify given that so many of these officers have have been out of you know they have retired now for a number of years and they, they may not wish to even engage anyway. They they may have moved on. So uh, how how quickly do you hope to be able to identify the the level of need that there may be and tool up the PRRT to be able to meet that? Well, I think. I mean, I think the first thing that we want to do is to engage with the PRRT. We we'll obviously have to put business cases and so forth together. My, my aim is to have uh, something in place by the second half of the financial year. I think the the action plan talks about um, uh, you know by by December service delivery commencing. Um, I mean, I am very conscious, uh, Chairman, that it will take PRRT some time to build. Capacity, um, and there is a risk. I think that when we introduce this, that we, we may in effect be opening a uh, floodgate uh, in terms of the numbers of staff who might come forward, and, and it is very difficult, as you've just said, to to quantify that. But but we want to try and get to a position where we can enter an arrangement with PRRT. We give them time to scale up so that we can have something in place before the end of the calendar year, but but hopefully. Uh, a little bit, a little bit before that. Okay, thank you, Ronnie. I'll bring in other members just at this stage. I may have some other points just to make in, in due course. But um, Rachel Woods, you've indicated to speak. Yes, Chair, thank you. Um, and thank you, Ronnie and Brandon, as well. And I also welcome the reports and the minister statement on Monday. Um, Paul has already asked uh, some of my questions just with regard to budgeting and finances, and I'm looking forward to getting some more information um, from yourselves whenever it's available. But my question relates to an issue that was brought up to me um, by constituents who, and I was I was happy to have been able to feed into this review and, and bring them in as well. But it was with regard to the um, civil service um, policies and wording of letters and the inefficiency terms and what was what was going out. And I appreciate that that is not something that was under the remit of yourselves, but wider civil ser service um, HR. And I know that that's in the recommendations as something that could potentially be done quite quickly. So I'm just looking to see if that has, uh, that term is gone can it, I know there were some legal issues there. If there's any more information in terms of that, I know it's quite a minority point, but it was certainly one that was brought up to me recurring, especially when people were off with um, mental health issues and, and be told that they were um, off and were breaching efficiency. So uh, I'm just wanting a little bit of an update on that if possible. No, I mean, I think, I think it's, an, it's an important point uh, in terms of, of the letters. Uh, the letters have been amended. My, my understanding is that the only use of the word inefficiency uh, in the letter is on, is on one occasion where the letters refer to procedures under the NICS inefficiency sickness absence policy. Um, and and that, is the current, that is the current policy. But other references to inefficiency, as I understand it, ha have been removed from the letter and I think that's a I think that's a positive development. We will be working closely with NICSHR on a number of the recommendations, as, as you will know in the report. And, and indeed, I'm meeting the director of NICSHR next Monday to to start that to start that process. And I will be raising the issue of the letter uh, with her. But but my understanding is that that recommendation has been addressed. Okay. Thank you, Ronnie. That's that's brilliant. Um, there was another point. Just wanted to to read the Blossoms project. Um, I was reading about that with interest at McGabry. Um, and staff. It said staff who had access to the provision identified that it was extremely beneficial. 
um, but majority of staff that participated in interviews were unaware of it. Is there any intention of rolling that out um, in sort of the next financial year and across the prison's estate? Well, we, we, we do give a commitment um, in the action plan uh, that we will that we will look at this, and indeed, uh, the Governor McGabry and I visited the Bros the Blossoms project um, just outside Larne uh, about a fortnight ago, uh, and we've we've had some discussions with with the, the folk who run that. Um, I mean, I I have to be honest and say I didn't know a lot about this project, uh, but I was extremely impressed when I went and spent an afternoon with them. Uh, just to see what they do and how they how they do it. Now, when we talk about rolling this out, it is important, I think, to set some context. Uh, the the program can take up to fourteen people at a time, um, and it and it meets a half day a week for a period of of eight weeks. So, you know, as we want to to look at rolling this out, and I'm very confident we'll be able to do that. Um, you know. The numbers that will go through it won't be huge uh, per year, uh, but what McGabry have been doing in their pilot is they've been focusing it on on the greatest need, and that's what I think we would want to do moving forward. But but certainly an excellent project, well well worth going to to see and, and spending time with the folk who run it. Thank you, Ronnie, and I look forward to finally getting to McGabry. I know we've had a number of false dawns because of COVID, um, but right certainly right. know that. That's it. That's it from from me, um, Chair. Thank you. And yeah, just want to um, welcome me both of these reports. I think they're very good and very timely. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Um, Gordon Dunn. Thanks, Chair, and thanks, Ronnie and Brent, for your presentation. Just on the six absence, uh, something that was discussed briefly in the chamber. I understand it's around three million pounds a year to cover sick absence in the past three years. Um, the Minister mentioned about the initiative Spend to Save. Uh, obviously, we, we welcome that and we want to see investment in, in new processes and support for, for prison officers and for all staff working in the prisons. How do you think that that will help to address the, the major issue there is in relation to, to sick absence? When we well, well, I think, um, uh, Mr Don, what, what these reports and, and the one for serving staff is about in particular is trying to intervene early to give better support to staff to prevent uh, sick absence where we where we can. And we have been trying to do that through the Prisons Well programme, as the report indicates, over the past uh, couple of years. And we and we have seen uh, our sick absence rates uh, fall a little bit. Now, if you were looking at the average number of days that an officer or officers were taking off in 2015 it would have been sitting at just over 21 whereas in the in the, the past year uh, that came down to 18.7 now you know i know 18.7 is still too high and still a major challenge for us but but i think there is indeed there is evidence that we're starting to make some headway with this and, and my hope is that as we implement this report and we put even better support mechanisms in place for staff that, that we can make further inroads into addressing uh, the sick absence um, issue that, that you're referring to. Yeah. Obviously, um, looking at, at, at that table, table 7-1, uh, the absence rate is higher than any other government department. There, you know, there's a comparison right across, and we appreciate that there are, are reasons for that, but I think it's important that more is done to try and, and address these issues, because uh, we understand your, your staff figures there are about 1,262. Is that right, Ronnie? Um, yes, I mean, the, the current, uh, if you give you the, the up to date staffing figures, uh, term on our operational staffing level is 1,320 for operational grades, and then we have administrative and support staff in addition to that. So 1320 and our full time equivalent at the moment is 1292. So we're sitting about 28 staff short of our of our operational uh, our operational target level. Okay, and obviously uh, um, as a result of this sick absence, uh, there obviously needs to be overtime or, or additional staff brought in to cover. How is that covered, Ronnie, in relation to? 
the day-to-day -day management of the prison? Well, when, when, well, you're, you're right in, in, in saying that if you're at your staff and compliment, and we're not very far away from it, mm. um, you know, overtime is not something that you would be expecting to, re to rely on. However, you know, where you have staff absence due to sickness, then obviously we have to cover those gaps and we would use overtime to do that. Um, we have been using over the past year very significant amounts of overtime um, because we've been dealing, as you know, with the, the COVID pandemic. Uh, we have every prisoner in single cell accommodation, uh, which means that our footprint in each of the prisons is greater than it would have been this time last year. We obviously have to, to staff that as well. So we've been using overtime uh, to do to do that. Um, so each, you know, each governor will have an overtime allowance per month. Um, over the pandemic, I've been giving them additional hours uh, to cover the pressures of, of COVID. But that, that in practice, uh, Mr. Dunn, is how, is how it works. Yeah, so there obviously is considerable overtime. That in itself puts stress on, on staff as well, if they're continually having to work overtime long hours and work weekends. Is that an issue that you're concerned about? Well, it's not. It's not been an issue that has been uh, had been raised with me. But but I absolutely uh, agree with the point you're making. You know, where staff are having to work uh, additional hours and, and lengthy hours, then yes, it would certainly add to I suppose the tiredness levels. Um, we we haven't had any issue. I have to say, over the past twelve months or, or well beyond that. In getting volunteers and people work overtime on a voluntary basis. It's not, it's not compulsory, uh, and we haven't had issues getting staff to volunteer. In fact, our, our staff have been exceptionally good over the COVID period in, in stepping forward uh, and, and and doing some extra hours for us uh, right ac right across the service. Okay, thanks for that. Thanks, Ronnie. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thank you, Gordon. Um, Doug Beatty and then Linda Dillon. And then and I can see Gemma, Emma, Sinead, so I'll, I'll try to get you all in. But um, Doug Beatty in the first instance. Uh, sure, thank you. And, and Ronnie, thank you. Um, you're, you're, you're as clear as always uh, in, your, in your answers. And, and like you, I welcome uh, every aspect of this report. I think it is genuinely first class uh, and it does take us in the direction we want to go. Um, and, I, and I'm certainly not going to be trying to pick holes in it, but there are a couple of questions, if you don't mind. And the first one is maybe around recommendation one, where it talks about uh, pay and grading, and then it goes on to grading quite a bit. But is there not still an issue that uh, when it comes to pay and the yearly pay issue, that um, the independent pay review body findings aren't released timely enough to um, allow people to look at it and scrutinise it and understand what they're negotiating? Well, um, the pay review body, if I, if I can deal with the current year that, that we're in, um, I mean, the pay review body made their report uh, back in, in September, at the end of September. Um, we, have, we have accepted their report, but there were some additional measures that I was keen to take, not, not least in the context that I think we're going into a very difficult period in terms of pay, where pay freezes and so on, uh, are, are, are being talked about. So there were some additional things that I was keen to do over and above what the pay review body recommended. And therefore, we've, we've gone into what has turned out to be quite a protracted negotiation uh, with, with the Prison Officers Association around this. Um, and that has delayed the publication of the report um, because we, you know, we, we can't publish the report until it, it, it is finalised. Now, you know, I, I have been in discussions, and Brendan in particular has been in discussions with the POA and, and the senior leadership of the POA in terms of the chairman and vice chairman have seen the report uh, very recently, albeit, but they have seen it. But I'm, I'm hopeful that we can reach an agreement with the POA that will allow us to implement the report uh, very quickly uh, and do some additional stuff that we'd like to do. If we can't reach that agreement with the POA, then we will move forward to publish the report and implement it, its findings. But, but that, that's a, a, an explanation without going into the, the minutiae of it of why there's been a delay this year. 
Yeah, and, and Ronnie, I, I get this because we probably have this conversation every year about about this and, and the negotiations that you go in. And every year, uh, you're absolutely right, it's protracted. Um, but, but I mean, if you've accepted the independent pay review and then you're doing add-ons, you know, uh, you know, if it was released in September, then you know you you, you would expect as we move into February um, that that it should be able to be to be viewed and understood. Um, and even what your position is in in trying to do things in regards um, to it. But listen, I'm not going to I'll not rattle on about that. I just always have a concern about about trying to get things fi fixed as, as early as possible. Pretty much in relation to recommendation one uh, and making sure morale stays in regards to, to pay. But can I ask you another question, um, Ronnie? Um, I think it was recommendation five talks about shift patterns. Uh, and within the, the prison service, we have prison custody officers, we have night custody officers, we have uh, main grades. Um, is there not, would it not make more sense when you look at these shift patterns that we have a universal grade, a universal position where an individual can work nights or can work days so that we don't have the shortages of staff that we are presently finding uh, in regards to night custody officers? Um, well, that, that takes us really back to the grading review piece that we're doing. Um, we are doing a review of all of our different grades. Um, and we're, you know, we have made good progress with this, but you know, it has been delayed because of because of COVID. We are hoping to get that grading review uh, complete in line with the commitments we've made in the action plan. I think that will then lead us into a discussion around different grades, what they do, and how we might, uh, to use your word, have a more universal uh, universal approach. That that's certainly something that I would be uh, that I would be open to. Um, I mean, in terms of the of the night custody uh, issue, um, I mean, I think the work of night custody officers is is different, um, and I and I think we'd want to think very very carefully about how we would we would proceed with with that. You're right to say there is a shortfall at the moment, uh, but but there is a surplus then on the custody officer grade, which is which is offsetting that. Um, I mean, in terms of night custody officers, there, there's an additional 16 have been deployed this week, uh, and a further class um, will be coming into the college on the 8th of March. So, you know, we are we are closing that gap, which at the moment is about we're around 30 short overall, but we are closing that gap, and I'd be very confident we'd have that gap closed uh, before the summer before the summer of this year. It is probably worth saying something just to, to put that in, in context. Uh, our last big recruitment campaign was around uh, custody prison officers. That was then followed by one in terms of night custody officers. So you can see at the minute we have a surplus of around 40 uh, custody prison officers and a shortfall of around 30 night custody officers. So it, it's, it's a matter of timing, but I think we will have that gap closed very soon. But in answer to your, your initial question, yes, very open to look at how we can uh, we can better use our, our grading structure. Yeah, and, I can, I, I, and Ronnie, I'm in no doubt whatsoever that you are making efforts to, to to fill that gap. So early in night custody officers, I, I read it, I've spoken to, to, to people about this, so I, I use a moving in the right direction, but there still is that differential. And that differential means that a night custody officer who's on at night uh, who gets paid less than a prison custody officer, um, that if you have to bring a prison custody officer to work nice to fill that gap, they're, they're each doing the same job, but, but both are getting different both are getting different different wages. And that's why I'm sort of saying maybe this universal position where people can do all jobs, uh, and that, that means you can direct your workforce slightly better wherever the gaps uh, you find are, as opposed to being stuck trying to recruit into one set of positions where actually all you need to do is just, just shift your workforce, if, if that makes sense. No, it, it absolutely makes sense. And it, as I said, it's something that we will look at when we've got the grading review complete, because that will, will give us a, a much better sense and a much better evidence base. I mean, the other group of staff, of course, that we, we shouldn't lose sight of, sight of are those who are working in the prisoner escort service. Yes, of course, uh, yeah. You know, they're, 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 they're another group 
alongside the night custody officers and the CPOs. So we, we, we will look at all of this in the round. No, listen, thank you, um, Ronnie, as, as ever. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Doug. Uh, Linda Dillon. Hello, Chair, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you, and thank you, Ronnie, for um, your answers so far and, and for coming to the committee today. I mean, as far as I can see, Ronnie, all recommendation of the re reviews have been um, accepted. Am, am I right in saying that? Yes, the, the Minister has accepted, I've accepted the recommendations. There are some, though, that need discussion with the Department of Finance. Um, yeah. So, you know, we're, we're accepting those in principle subject to, to discussion with the Department of Finance. So I'm, I'm going to open those discussions with the Director of HR next week. Uh, and then there can be ministerial involvement at a, at a, at a later stage when, when officials have worked through some of the detail. But, but yes, we, we are supportive of the recommendations. Okay, I appreciate that, and, and I think it's good that that Gillian and Siobhan are going to stay on, and I mean do some work and and do some follow up on this, because very often people do a report and then that's that's the end of their involvement. So I think that's a positive a positive move. And in terms of your, yourself, I know that in conversations we've had, you've been more than open to the suggestions around how things can be improved, and I think that's that's a positive attitude from anybody that's in a leadership role and I've said that to you before so just to make that point again can you just maybe give me a wee outline of what you think what recommendations you think will be the most ch challenging or difficult to implement and then in terms of recommendations five six and seven um, it sort of follows on a wee bit from what Doug is saying around the, the shift patterns and um, you know Obviously, there 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 be a culture change required to better support staff who are experiencing stress and mental health, and all of that, and may require longer time scale. But could recommendations five, six, and seven be done relatively quickly? Do you think, or is that going to take a period of time also? And and I suppose I'm also saying that on the basis of a conversation that we did have with some of the staff, whenever myself and Emma were in McGabry and. The, He's had made some slight changes to shift pattern to try and improve things for staff, and that that was, um, and certainly in terms of the staff that I spoke to, they they felt that it was very well received and and had helped in terms of staff morale and just in their general working conditions and improving that. So so I know you are open to all of that. It's not a question of whether you'll do it; it's just can it be done quickly. Well, I think in, in, in answer to your question, um, I think most of these things can be done this year. Um, I mean, we've outlined in each of the recommendations uh, a, a timescale that, that we're going to work towards. Um, I mean, I, I share your view that the review of shift patterns is, is a very important uh, aspect of this report. Um, and I also welcome the fact that the, the authors of the report recognise that this is complex uh, and that rec and recognise that, that I have a balancing act to deliver here. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm I'm very supportive, and, and you've seen yourself as you referred to in McGabry where we have made some changes. Very keen that we address work-life balance issues, uh, yeah. but but equally I have to be mindful that there is a business to be delivered, um, and we need to be sure at all times that we have the right people in the right place at the right time, because the implications for us of not having that. Uh, is, is around prisoners being locked in their cells uh, and that is something that, that you know isn't acceptable to us um, and something that we have worked extremely hard to make sure isn't the case. So there, there is a balance here uh, and what I want to do is to appoint somebody relatively quickly who will look at the ship patterns, who will look at the profiles and will come up with something uh, that I think will be very acceptable to staff but will equally allow us to deliver the important business that we're that we're tasked with delivering. In, in terms of your question about uh, the, the most the most difficult, again in the action plan we're we're trying here to, to flag up things where we think there are uh, we can make progress with quickly. I think probably the most difficult one will be putting that service in place to support to support staff. I mean the report talks about a bespoke service it, and it recognises that there are procurement issues and so forth. So I think that will that will take a little bit of time. I think that's probably 
uh, one of the more challenging ones, but I think it, it it's perhaps the most important to deliver, um, and and we will we will do everything we can to do that uh, as quickly as we can. I think some of the issues around HR that are being highlighted in relation to, for example, uh, you know, occupational health and processes. There, mm -hmm. I think there are there are complexities around those things as well. Uh, but again, uh, you know, confident that we will find a way through uh, to to deliver what what Siobhan and Gillian are, are recommending. I mean, I think the right thing is to keep Siobhan and Gillian working with us. I think the report is excellent. I think it's evidence based. You couldn't argue with it or anything in it. Uh, and I think having them um, as as sort of almost mentors for me working through this will be will be really uh, will be really helpful and will get a beneficial outcome for for all concerned. I appreciate that, Chair. If you just allow me one more quick question, and again, it's just following on from what Doug said, and maybe there does need to be you know a look at that. Oh, is there a need for to have the universal approach? And, and I understand what you're saying in terms of of the challenges around that, but we've just talked about the sick leave and maybe there needs to be a more detailed piece of work around the sick leave. And, and is there some of that um, related to work-life balance and, and, and all of those issues? So I, I think that some of that stuff needs to be looked at in the round where there, I understand that there are issues in terms of finance as well around staff, but where we're potentially maybe trying to save money is ending up costing us money in sick leave. So I suppose that's where we need to look at. And then just a comment more than a question in relation to the bespoke service. There are some really good examples of best practice, obviously in other um, parts of the world, and maybe we should be be looking to those to to those examples of best practice. Thank you, Chair. I mean, I, I absolutely uh, agree, and, and we will we will look to see, you know, what what is the best practice and what is the best uh, that that we can deliver for for our staff. And, and I think, you know, having Siobhan and Gillian alongside us will be will be helpful in that because you know they, to be fair, have done some of that work in terms of of looking out there. Um, and I think it will be very useful to us to have them as a as a point of contact. Yeah. No problem. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Ronnie. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to Ronnie and Brenton for um, the presentation. I, I have um, a knock over things that have already been raised, but I just want to go on record to, to welcome the report. And, and in particular, I like its proactive. Um, approach that it does it does attempt to to get in early before any problems arise and to, to sort of proactively get engaged but and also I, I think the action plan does fairly reflect um, not just adoption of the recommendations but a, a real you know dated attempt at trying to timeline this out which is always very reassuring because I think sometimes this committee they are the types of um, pieces of information we find ourselves trying to chase. So in terms of then, um, and, and again, I would also be putting on record um, my thanks to Gillian and Siobhan and the fact that they will be um, retaining you know, their, their handprint on this and following it as it monitors through. But in terms of then reporting back to the committee, because there are such succinct um, timelines, I just wonder what the mechanism there will be, Ronnie, because it is a, it's very good that we have an opportunity to speak so directly to you on this and will there be an opportunity for us to monitor progress as and when it, it happens and is recorded? Thank you. Um, I mean, I, I, I would certainly welcome that. Um, I mean, when, when we put together the action plan, we wanted to make this ambitious and I think, you know, I wanted to demonstrate to the Minister and indeed the committee that, that we are determined to drive forward with this, not notwithstanding all the challenges we have at the moment are around around COVID. Um, I, I will be reporting regularly to, to the Minister. Um, it is of course a matter for the for the committee how they, they want me to report to, to, to you, but but it might be helpful um, if I came back to the committee, you know, either late June or early September to give you an update in terms of 
the action plan and the work we we have we have done uh, so that you can keep a you know keep a watching brief and a, and a handle on the progress that's been made and i'd be very happy to come back at any time but 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 it might be useful to do it around those milestones um i think by the summer we will be able to demonstrate very clear and, and visible progress um and i'd be happy to come back as i said any time to to update the committee uh on, on on the work that we're doing thank you ronnie thank you chair okay thank you um Gemma Dolan. Christine. Christine. There's only one more after Gemma, if you want to let the department know. Um, if uh, the broadcasting can bring in Gemma Dolan for me, thank you. Okay, Gemma, that's you now. Thanks, Chair. Thanks very much. Thanks, Ronnie. I just have one question, and it's just um, currently, as it stands, are there any training programs or personal development programs for the staff in the prison service, or will this be a totally new approach? For the service and for the staff. Well, we we do have our own uh, training department at, at the prison service college. Uh, I mean, we 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 have a lot of mandatory training that we have to do, uh, and that's carried out by our, our our excellent tutors at the at the college. We also do recruit training for new people coming in, uh, and we do training for for different for different grades of staff and. In different areas, it could be in mental health or in a range of in a range of different things. So what we're saying in the report is that the training that's recommended here, you know, some of that we're 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 doing, some of it we need to do, but but we want to put that all together as a package uh, in terms of our of our training of our training provision. Yeah, no, that's great. No, I was just wondering, you know, in case it was new, would it be a culture shock and would there be a negative kickback? But if it's if it's already more or less in place, then it should be fine. That's it. But that's that's all my questions, Chair. Thank you. I think staff will welcome the training. I yeah. don't think there'll be any resistance to that at all. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Gemma. Uh, Emma Rogan. Thanks, Chair. Um, hi, Ronnie. Um, I hope you're well. Um, yeah. In the review, um, it recommend the recommendation two B. It's interesting. It recommends that interviews are not solely based on competency and should be situational based as well. That yeah. the test areas is resilience and attitude and self care. Has there been any sort of thought given to how that would look or how that would work? You know, would it be along the lines of I, I was thinking this is very simplistic in my own head that it would be if you apply for a job, you get an aptitude test. Would this be like an attitude to these, how you would react to these stressful situations? Because as you know, when we were in um, McGabry, um, a few months back, myself and Linda, we met with some of the staff and, and to be to be frank, it opened my eyes to the situations that they have to deal with. You know, it's not just a case of locking up prisoners and turning the key and that's it. You know, they have a care and responsibility in there. They have to rehabilitate. They have to reintegrate the prisoners back into society. And without that, Th those types of staff that wouldn't happen. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, about, yeah. Um, recently, we have ran promotion boards to senior officer, and as part of that, we brought in a situational judgment test as part of that process. So we worked with the company to develop that with our, with um, our prison service college, with a senior governor, and, and people from the prison officers association also played part of that. So we we're starting to develop some thinking around. It's a situational judgment how people would react to certain situations in a prison setting, because I think, um, it's, as you say, it's very important. You know, to just what we've been doing is doing a half an hour interview on someone. It's very, it's very difficult to get a flavour of, of the job. So what we have done over the last few months is a few of our unit managers have taken on a project to look at how we can better recruit, and part of that is how we 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 not just go to the interview, but also how we develop our website to have situations in there so people can get a feel for the job even before they apply as well. So it's, I suppose it's a, it's a multi-discipline approach to this really that um, we want to take forward. That's great because that leads me on to my, my second question. I suppose it's more a comment than it's about that. Um, the recruitment, you know, it's, it's trying to uh, attract the people to the job. You know, 
stereotypically the people that I seen on your in your in the prison in McGabry are not what I stereotypically w would have thought a prison officer was there was you know it, there was ranges of people of all different walks of life but when you think of prison officer and if the job advertisement it's how do we attract those people from all sections of the community to, to think that actually that is a job role that I could do and how do we attract those that are miss on 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 underrepresented within the service to that um to that role i mean I, I don't know i couldn't agree more to be honest with you and it's something we're actively looking at i mean we've great, made great progress in the last number of years women coming into the, the service and you'll have probably seen that for yourself um the number of, of women now working in the service is i think it's in the right 30 percent or so whereas it works historically it was much lower than that but you're right we, we, we still progress to be made and and we're very focused on that i mean i i mean i agree with you uh, as, as well emma uh, i mean I've, I've been open with this committee in the past and said we do have a an issue in, in retracting uh, staff from right across the community uh, and we for our part are very keen to address that um you know we, we have our prisons unlocked program, for example, that we're very keen to take out to, to, to schools and universities and into the community. Now we're limited at the minute in what we can do because of the because of the ongoing pandemic. But but we are very keen uh, to reach into all communities uh, to give a very clear understanding to, to people right across um, right across the country what the role of a prison officer is. And you know I, I think for far too long People in society have this view that prison officers simply swing keys and, and lock doors. Uh, and I think you, you have highlighted uh, very well for us that there is much more to that job. And I, and I do see it um, as, as part of a, of a caring profession. Um, because yes, we do have to hold people securely and safely uh, if they're sent to us by the courts. But, but there is a great opportunity in prisons to do so much more with people uh, around their rehabilitation and around seeking to reduce the likelihood of them reoffending when they leave. Uh, and I think one of the things we've been able to do in the past couple of years, and Programme for Government has been, I think, a very good help to us on this, is to refocus the service around what is our purpose. And our purpose is about supporting and challenging people to change, and it's about reducing the rate of reoffending which is to the benefit of us, of us all right across society. And, and it's how we get that message, I think, out into communities to say, you know, you know, a career in the prison service is something that's very worthwhile and it's a job where you can come to and make a real difference because you're dealing with some of the most challenging people in society, but also some of the most vulnerable. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm very keen to work with the committee and in, in, in looking at ways as to how we can better reach out uh, into the community to, to attract to attract um, recruits from from right across. Thanks, Chair. I have no more questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Emma. Um, okay, Ronnie. That that concludes the session. So can I thank you for your contributions to this? Obviously, it'll be a, an ongoing piece of work, and I know individual members will. No doubt to follow this up. Um, I would be keen that before certainly the summer recess that we could get um, a more formal update. Um, so if we were able to aim for before the end of June for even a written paper um, outlining how the, the action plans and recommendations are being taken forward and implemented, that would be helpful. Okay. Well, listen. We'll we'll formally write to you anyway. So, if members are content, we will seek a follow up in terms of how the action plan is being implemented and request that um, before the the end of June. Then, before the summer recess would take place. Okay. Well, listen. Thank you, Ronnie. Um, thank you, members. That that moves us on. If you're happy to move to the next item on the agenda, then in respect of the um, private injury discount. Issue: The damages return on investment bill and the uh, request for accelerated passage. So, as agreed at last week's meeting, the Minister of Justice is attending with officials via the Starleaf facility.
and to outline her reasons for seeking accelerated passage for the damages bill. The relevant papers, members, including a briefing paper setting out the reasons for accelerated passage, are on pages 172 to 246 of your meeting pack. And then there was a, a meeting that took place um, yesterday with uh, FOIL, um, and, and there's a breakdown of what organisations that included uh, yesterday, which some members were able to attend. Uh, a note of those key issues um, is in the uh, tabled pack. So there's also a timeline, members, that uh, has been prepared for you in turn, uh, that covers all of the committee um, consideration of this issue going right back to the uh, February of last year. And uh, that's helpfully laid out by way of a summary um, for members' benefit in terms of your consideration of these this matter as well. What um, page is that, Chair? Uh, there, there's a hard copy that was is provided, it? Um, and it'll have been emailed right. to other members. Good job, thank you. Okay, so hopefully the minister is available. Um, okay, yes, Naomi's there, so thank you, Minister. So, um, if I can formally welcome Naomi Long, Minister of Justice, to the meeting, per uh, Peter May, Permanent Secretary, and Lauren. McAlpine, uh, the Deputy Director in the Civil Justice Policy Division, and the session will be recorded by Hansard and a transcript published in due course. So, Minister, I'll hand over to you at this stage. Um, thank you, um, Chair. Very much appreciate it. Um, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to address the Committee on why the Damages Return on Investment Bill needs accelerated passage. I'm particularly grateful to the committee for making the time, particularly at what is quite short notice. The reason for seeking accelerated passage for this bill is to allow a stable discount rate to be set as soon as possible, as this is the only way to bring about an end to the ongoing uncertainty and consequent delays that claimants are experiencing in the settlement of personal injury claims. Currently, the rate set under Wales versus Wales is 2.5%. The department has concluded, however, that the Wales versus Wales methodology does not deliver 100% compensation and that legislation should be brought forward as quickly as possible to change the basis on which the rate is set. Both claimants and defendants have for some time been expecting the rate to change and almost certainly to reduce, whether under Wells versus Wells or as the department has now decided under a new legal framework. For claimants, even a small downward adjustment in the rate can mean a substantial increase in their lump sum. Um, and so it would not be in claimants' interests to offer um, pay, uh, to offer to settle cases until the rate has been reduced. Until that happens, cases are being deferred, um, creating a backlog um, in the courts. I want um, I want to be able um, to set a new rate in place as soon as possible um, to bring these delays to an end and enable claimants to have the full amount of compensation to which they're legally entitled. It's also not in the interest of defendants to have cases delayed. I am aware that parties are in some cases negotiating settlements outside the prescribed rate, but that is not possible in all cases, and many cases are just on hold. None of us wants that, and it's especially not good for people who have suffered serious injury and want to receive their compensation so they can get on with their lives. This uncertainty will only end when a stable rate is set under a new legislative framework. It follows that we want that framework in place as soon as possible, hence this request for accelerated passage. If accelerated passage is granted, I would be hopeful that the bill would receive royal assent by summer and possibly even sooner, depending on the Assembly. Under the legislation, the government actuary would be required to set a new rate within 90 days, and I'm hopeful that they will be able to do so more quickly. <coughs> so a new rate could be set by early autumn. I cannot say that this would be possible outside an accelerated passage procedure. I'm sure no one will disagree with the policy aim of the bill, which is to deliver the legal principle of 100% um, compensation better than is currently the case. In giving effect to that, the bill is largely technical in nature, prescribing the detail of how the government actuary will determine the rate. I do appreciate that technical or not, however, the committee would prefer to scrutinise this bill as normal, and normally <clears throat> we would welcome that input. In respect of this bill, however, the time taken for scrutiny will inevitably mean that it will take longer for the bill to be enacted and a new fixed rate under it. Such delay is not in the best interests of personal injury claimants. In terms of steps taken to minimise future use of accelerated procedure, I can assure the committee I have no plans to use the procedure again and would not expect the particular circumstances of this bill to arise again. This is very much an exceptional request. 
I'm happy to answer any questions members have about accelerated passage. However, I think First Lorraine is going to talk you through the detail of the bill itself. Thank you, Minister. Lorraine. Um, thank you also, Chair, for the opportunity to brief the Committee on the content of the Draft Damages Return on Investment Bill. The Bill will amend the Damages Act 1996 as it applies to Northern Ireland to put in place a new statutory framework for setting the discount rate. The Minister has already referred to the legal principle of 100% compensation, meaning uh, that an award of damages for future financial losses should fully compensate a claimant for those losses, but no more and no less. The Bill does not change this, uh, and indeed, as the Minister had said, the, the overall purpose of the Bill is to give better effect to that core principle. While the provision in the Bill, in particular in the Schedule, is quite technical, in summary, it does three key things. Firstly, it provides for the task of reviewing and determining the discount rate to be carried out by the Government Actuary. That is in Clause 1, um, which provides for a new section to be inserted into the 1996 Act. Secondly, the Bill sets out a new methodology for how the rate is to be calculated based on the assumption that a claimant invests their damages award in a mixed portfolio of low-risk investments. This is to reflect the reality of how a claimant would be advised to invest their lump sum and in contrast to the current framework which applying wells and wells assumes a claimant invests only in very low risk index linked gilts. And thirdly, the bill establishes a time frame for regular reviews of the rate. The detail of the new methodology and the time frame for reviews are provided in a new schedule. Uh, to be inserted in the 1996 Act by Clause 2 of the Bill. Returning to the schedule, paragraphs 1 and 2 deal with the timing of reviews. So the first review will begin as soon as the legislation is commenced and will be a review of the current rate of 2.5%. The next review will be in July 2024 to align with the reviews of the discount rate in Scotland and the rate will then be reviewed every five years. The Department does have a power under the Bill to require an earlier review, but this would not affect the cycle of, of five yearly reviews. Under paragraph 3, the Government Actuary is required to complete a review of the rate within 90 days. And the next paragraphs in the schedule set out the basis on which the Government Actuary is to determine the discount rate. Under paragraph 7, it is to reflect the rate of return on investment over a 43-year period in the notional portfolio, and the notional portfolio is set out in paragraph 12. Under paragraph 9, the rate is to be adjusted to take account of inflation, and paragraph 10 provides for two standard adjustments, a, a deduction of 0.75% to take account of taxation and the cost of investment uh, advice and management and a deduction of 0.5% as a further margin. The fact that the investments assumed to be made by a claimant are specified in the legislation is one of the reasons for adopting the Scottish model as the basis on which the rate is calculated is thereby clear and transparent. The 43-year assumed investment period is a small difference to the Scottish framework which uses a period of 30 years. We have opted for the 43-year period on the basis of evidence that this reflects the average period over which personal injury claimants invest. In England and Wales also used a 43-year period. Further margin of 0.5% to which I referred is intended to protect against the risk of undercompensation in view of the risk inherent in any investment, however carefully advised. The schedule gives the Department a number of powers to change by secondary legislation the parameters within which the Government Actuary is to set the rate. So this includes in paragraph 8 a uh, power to change the assumed period of investment of 43 years. Paragraph 11 confers a power to change the amount of the standard adjustments and paragraph 15 confers a power to make changes to the notional portfolio. Any regulations made under these powers are subject to draft affirmative procedure, so will be subject to scrutiny by the Assembly. 
The provision in the bill therefore ensures that there is political accountability in relation to how the rate is set, while at the same time recognising that once the method for calculating the rate is prescribed in legislation, the task of applying it to determine the rate is really an actuarial exercise. Paragraphs towards the end of the schedule include provision for the government actuary to send a report of his review to the department, that's paragraph 23, which then the department must lay before the assembly under paragraph 24, and under paragraph 25, the discount rate as determined by the government actuary will come into effect on the day after the report is laid. And finally, clauses three to six of the bill are about ancillary matters, um, interpretation and commencement. We're happy to take any questions that the committee might have. Okay, thank you. A um, couple of questions then, just for me. Um, in terms of the, the bill having been drafted um, based upon the Scottish model, if I can just ask what the timeline has been by, by the department in respect of that, um, because in a letter dated the 10th of December, um, the committee advised the department that the committee required further engagement with the department of key stakeholders as to whether or not the committee supported the Scottish model in relation to the new framework. And um, we've noted that in the letter the committee received on the 19th of January that the draft bill was only settled last week. So on that basis, did the department proceed with um, getting this bill led, drafted in terms of the legislation to implement the permanent secretary's preferred framework without first knowing whether the committee supported the Scottish model? Instructions for the bill were sent um, November. I think we saw a first draft early December and a final version 13th of January. Yes, but in terms of the question, Lorraine, um, did the department get the go ahead with getting instructions despite this committee not having given an indication as to whether or not it supported the Scottish model? We don't have that indication from the committee. The executive, though, approved uh, instructions to draft. Okay, so again, just to answer that question, did the department go to the executive to seek approval to legislate or to get a bill instructed to be legislated on the Scottish model without having sought the view of this committee? Yes, I did as Minister. Okay. Okay. Um, in terms of adopting the, the model that Scotland added, the additional margin that ensures the applicant was not undercompensated and accepted that in doing so there was a risk that it could result in overcompensation. Just clarify for me, the department, um, and you've said it again today, the core objective here is 100% compensation, not anything less and not anything more. The Scottish model seems to build in through their deliberate policy decision of a 0.5% margin to ensure that there's no risk of undercompensation at all. So does the Scottish model present the risk of overcompensation and is that at odds with the Department of Justice's stated position that it only wants 100% compensation? Well, it's a legal principle of 100% compensation, but how you achieve that is not an exact science. I mean, the same principle applies in England and Wales and I believe in Ireland. Uh, and everybody is just trying to devise a methodology that best delivers that, we think our bill best delivers it. Scotland obviously think the same about theirs and England and Wales about theirs. We do also have the 0.5 uh, further margin, um, but we also have provided for a slightly longer investment period than Scotland, um, which might tend to uh, a higher return on investments. Yeah, do, does the England and Welsh model include the built-in 0.5% to ensure there's no risk of undercompensation? Under it's not in their statutory framework. It's left to the discretion uh, of the Lord Chancellor. He has certain assumptions which he applies. This is why we think our bill and the Scottish bill is, is clear and transparent because we know what the investments are supposed to be. 
We know what the, the statutory adjustments are supposed to be. Uh, the department with the approval of the assembly can change those assumptions and adjustments that it, it's clear on the face of the legislation, whereas in England and Wales it's, it's more a matter for the Lord Chancellor's discretion who will be advised by a panel of experts. He did apply, uh, when they, they changed their rate in uh, 2019, they did apply a 0.5 deduction. Um, in terms of the change of 30 years to 43 years, are you able to provide an example as to what the differential that would mean by way of a, a payment? We wouldn't know that until um, GAD ran the numbers. It will, it will become uh, apparent potentially when GAD went at a review when um, GAD run the numbers against the notional portfolio of 30 years in the case of Scotland and against uh, an investment period of, of 43 years in the case of Northern Ireland. But it may be with rounding that, that it will actually make no difference because if it's less than a quarter percent, uh, it might not be that significant a difference anyway. Okay, but the proposed model then isn't the Scottish framework in that respect because it's not 30 years, which is what it is in Scotland, it's 43 years. Well, it's the Scottish framework in the sense that the government actually makes the decision and it's based on a notional portfolio and their prescribed deductions. Uh, it's entirely possible that going forward, either Scotland or Northern Ireland under their legislation could change their respective portfolios or change the amount of the deduction. Um, one of the issues that we had identified um, in England, Wales, Scotland, the, are you able to clarify that the Treasury, they uh, were granting access to the Treasury Reserve, recognising the increased payments that would be made. Um, is that the case here, that we would get access to the Treasury Reserve um, for the additional payments that would be required as a result of this change? I think that is a question for largely the Department of Health and the Department of Finance. The Department of Justice in setting the rate does not take into account um, the cost to defendants. Uh, we recognise that potentially as a cost, but it's for those departments to put uh, a figure on that. I think Department of Finance officials and Department of Health officials may be considering an approach to the Treasury, that is a matter for them, it is not a matter for the Department of Justice. Um, but the Department of Justice in setting up this new framework and new rate is going to have a knock-on impact for what money is spent for medical negligence claims, for example, to the Department of Health. So it, That's right. Yeah. But the, the principle is 100% compensation. Uh, and that's the, the criteria that, that we're following. Um, um, in terms of the removal of the ministerial accountability in the, in the Scottish framework, um, in looking at the draft bill and the schedule, it makes reference that the department, by way of uh, regulation, could then change the, the rate of discount. So are you going to be truly independent in the sense of having an expert panel that sets the rate but retaining the power to provide a regulation that could change the 0.5% uh, the for example? We don't have an expert panel setting the rate. The, the, the portfolio is set in the legislation so it's the government actuary um, that applies that, if it was considered that the portfolio was no longer suitable, well that's something we would consider alongside advice from um, the government actuary. An impact assessment on the insurance industry in Northern Ireland, um, has that been carried out in terms of these changes and what would be the implications for businesses and consumers? No, it hasn't because again, the cost to dependents isn't uh, a consideration in setting the rate. It's about securing 100% compensation and it's not a matter of, well, 100% compensation is going to cost defendants too much 
Therefore, we will give plaintiffs less than 100% compensation. The plaintiffs are entitled to what they're entitled to under the law, uh, which is 100% compensation. And this is just the best way we can devise to deliver that. Okay, I'm going to bring in other members at this point. So, uh, Sinead Bradley, you've indicated to come in. Chair, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you um, for the information to date. In terms of the issue of accelerated passage, which is what we're considering here at the moment, um, I take it from your commentary that the executive um, gives the consent to go ahead with the drafting of the bill. Was accelerated passage mentioned at executive level at that stage? Yes, um, I raised the issue that I may seek accelerated passage for this, but it was highly likely that I would do so. Um, and I have also flagged to the executive that I will be discussing it with the committee today. So they are aware um, of the need for accelerated passage in this particular case. Thank you, Minister. And, and I noticed then that um, you know the, the urgency behind the accelerated passage, I think there was a difference of um, maybe the best part of maybe six months if there wasn't accelerated passage in the timeline. So that obviously shows how you could potentially get this across the line faster and I, and I see and accept that. But I do wonder then, um, I'm trying to get a scale of the problem. So for example, that would have weight if there were cases waiting and it wouldn't have weight if there were zero cases. And I don't know how many cases there are um, against not just the private and the public sector, but also uh, I don't have any understanding or I've not seen any evidence of those who are outstanding cases. Are, are they being made aware that they can claim an interim payment? So while we tinker, I suppose, around the margins in terms of this percentage, the larger part of any payment that they are due could be settled while this piece of work is being carried out. Are you aware of any efforts or attempts made to make sure that claimants understand that? Well, to answer the first part of your question, it's impossible to know exactly how many cases um, are awaiting settlement. How close a case might otherwise be to settling would really only be known by the individual parties to that claim. In correspondence from the Association of Personal Injury Lawyers in September, we were told that the majority of their settlements are on hold, so this is a significant issue. However, we wouldn't have figures to put against that. Um, the second point, um, with respect to the advice given to claimants, that isn't something over which the department has any influence whatsoever. Um, people in this situation would be seeking their own independent legal advice, and it would be for um, their solicitor, for their legal representatives, to give them advice as to whether they should take a partial settlement, whether they should um, take an advance payment, or whether um, they should continue to hold out um, until the point where um, the rate has been changed. So all of those would be very much um, subject to the legal advice given to individuals tailored to their specific circumstances and need. It may not always um, be possible um, to negotiate um, some kind of an advance payment if there's been no agreement as to um, the extent of any future payment, but that wouldn't be something over which the department would have any influence. Okay. Yeah, and I'm sure you'd appreciate um, in that that then, in one sense, you know, we are being asked to forego a scrutiny and committing stage for something where there are alternatives to partially settling, and we don't know the scale of what the problem is, which is really difficult then to make a judgment on. Um, and then looking at um, the Scottish model, which the framework, which you know, which you have essentially adopted. The, the framework of the Scottish model, as far as I've been led to believe, quite explicitly and openly declares that it is there to ensure that the claimant will not be safeguarded and will not be undercompensated. And, and I mean, that's quite a strong political position to take, but they've taken it and, and they're open about it. And we're, if we're adopting that model, I do have concerns then about us deviating from that in part, and I know the chair did speak to this. So that deviation where we're taking the Scottish framework, but then we're adding in the 
for the, uh, the extra years that have been adopted by the Welsh and English, so from 30 to 43 years. Now, to my mind, I would have thought that the longer you invest a portfolio, be it notional or not, the more return you would, you would likely to see. So I'm wondering, are we taking one position and amplifying what could be um, a difference between the two models by extending the number of years on the notional portfolio? And while I'm mentioning that notional portfolio, I also just want to ask the question, who, who actually set the first original notional portfolio? Well, on the, on the political question, um, with respect to the request for accelerated passage, the reason that we are asking for accelerated passage is because we know um, from the, the claims um, that there are delays for people. We know um, that there are people who are seeking um, to have their claims settled who don't feel that they can do so at the moment. Um, and that is backed up with the information of, that, that I, record, uh, I recorded um, earlier in the discussion. Um, it's also still, remember, a legal duty on us to ensure um, that every victim receives their 100% compensation. That's what we have to aim to achieve. That's what we're required to do. And at the moment, that's what we can't um, actually achieve. So it's important that we do this irrespective of how many people are waiting, because we're not actually fulfilling our obligation in terms of delivering 100% compensation. And we need to correct that as soon as is, as is possible. So there is an imperative to do this and to do it quickly. Uh, with respect um, to the technical aspects of this, I'll, I'll pass to Lorraine um, to, to go into more detail, but bear in mind that whatever portfolio is set um, and whatever term of investment is set, that will then be assessed by the government actuary in terms of the outturn of that. So it isn't something um, that, if you like, that adjustment um, to either the length of investment or the portfolio uh, won't be accounted for in the work of the government actuary, but I'm happy to hand across to Lorraine for um, the detail on that. On the 43 years, we, we have taken into account that that is, in reality, based on evidence from, from MOJ, that the average length of uh, a personal injury claimant's investment period. So that's evidence-based. I, I don't know uh, where the, the 30 years came from in Scotland. In regard to the notional portfolio, we have consulted with GAD and they have indicated that it is still an appropriate portfolio. I can't honestly speak to where Scotland um, came up with the portfolio in the first place, but I would expect it was after consultation with GAD, and GAD has certainly indicated to us that it's, it's still currently appropriate. Okay, so, so, so sorry, you are just mirroring exactly the Scottish portfolio. Um, but, After consultation with okay. GAD. And have you considered then, uh, Lorraine, that, that consideration that um, the, the extension of the year, so, so without understanding why they have gone for 30 years, may it be that the 30 years, for want of a better word, was to tame the fact that they are leaning into being um, unapologetically a more claimant friendly bill, and that the 30 years may be some way of rectifying any or adjusting any overpayment that may happen? Is that something we should be investigating? Because the 43 years might actually amplify um, any correction that was needed, if that is the case, and I don't know that it is. I think both England and Wales and Scotland and Northern Ireland are about 100% compensation. It is not about a claimant-friendly bill or a defendant-friendly bill. It is about how do we deliver 100% compensation and I said in practice that the 30 year, 43 year period with, with rounding might not actually make any difference um, in practice when GAD comes to run the numbers. And we went for 43 uh, as did England and Wales because that is there is an evidence basis for that. Can I just add, um, um, Lorraine might just uh, make sure that I'm what I'm totally saying is correct, but my understanding is that in all of Scotland, England and Wales, there is currently the half percent margin applied. The difference is that in Scotland, it is on the face of the legislation, whereas in England, it is for the discretion of the Lord Chancellor. And if at some point the Lord Chancellor chose to change that, he would be able to do so 
uh, without recourse to the legislature again, whereas our proposal would require any change to that margin or to the notional portfolio to come back in front of uh, the Assembly and to be debated and considered in, in, in that way. So to some extent, our approach is a more transparent approach, but I don't think that the margin actually makes a difference in practical terms currently, even though the two pieces of legislation say slightly different things. Okay, I appreciate that, and I do appreciate that assurance because it did concern me that you know we were sticking to the script in large part for proposing to, and then deviating with something that could have effect um, to the overall. And yes, I think ultimately, whilst everybody is aiming at the one hundred percent, that that's why I was concerned that in that deviation we may be doing something that would take us further from the hundred um, percent, which is everybody's target. You know, ultimately from whatever. Is agreed or decided, but yeah, I'm trying to weigh up. As you can appreciate, the accelerated passage piece is based on the need, the duty to to ensure that the 100% can be achieved as soon as possible, um, and that is a duty on the department. And I do appreciate that. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Just just to clarify, um, whilst the Lord Chancellor had the discretion to use the 0.5. Does the Scottish model not have two steps in terms of uh, adding to the percentage? So they have a 0 0.25 and then the 0 0.5. Is that where we get yeah. the, is that where we get the difference between the the percentage in England and Wales compared to Scotland? No, we have a, a 0.5 percent for the further margin, and we've 0 0.75 for investment advice and, and management and that sort of thing. And of that in Scotland as well, and the Lord Chancellor applied uh, the same deductions, but he did so as a matter of discretion. Um, whereas Scottish legislation has it on the face of the bill as do we, and if we want to change it, then we would have to go uh, to the Assembly to change those um, margins. So, how how do we account for the current different? difference in the rate between the Scottish model and the, the English and Welsh? Well, uh, there are a couple of reasons for it. One is that England and Wales fixed its rate at a slightly different time from Scotland, so there were some market adjustments between the, the two time periods. Uh, also, they used um, a slightly different portfolio. I think the, the portfolio that the Lord Chancellor relied on was maybe um, not identical to the uh, Scottish portfolio. And there was a third reason which currently escapes me. Yeah. Um, it's just whenever we, we met with a group um, to discuss... Oh, yes. The, sorry, the 30-year, 43-year period may have counted for a difference between the, the English and, and the Scottish rate. So, Everybody's aiming for 100%, but I mean, Scotland and England and Wales are, are, are at different rates. And um, when the GAD runs the Northern Ireland figures, we may very well be at a, a different rate again because the market will be different um, than when it was when England and Scotland uh, yeah. ran their rates. Yeah, because a number of us met with the representatives of the Forum of Insurance Lawyers and they gave us an example. Um, of an award um, and under the Scottish model um, they were indicating that that would equate to £10 million and um, whereas under the England and Welsh model it would be £8.5 million. Um, so there's a differential there of £1.5 million more in Scotland but that was based on the Scottish 30 years. So if we were to go for 43 years logic would seem to indicate that that would be a further differential um, and compared to the English rate. So if, if everybody is wanting to achieve 100% compensation, no more and no less, on that example that we were given, the difference is well over a million pounds and under the move to 43 years, which you're not able to quantify or provide an example, that could be even more. I would caution against uh, attributing the difference between England and Wales solely to the difference between the 30 and the 43 year period. My impression is that it was really to do with, the, mostly to do with the timing in which the English rate was set and the Scottish rates were set and there were also some 
slight differences in their portfolios. Uh, and if there is a difference when the Northern Ireland rate is set, it will, it will not be because of the 30 or 43 years or maybe some difference because of that. But the main difference will be because the markets will have shifted so significantly from when the English rates and the Scottish rates were set. Okay, Linda Dillon. Sorry, Chair. Um, thank you, Lorraine, on, on point you Minister. A lot of what I, I was going to ask has actually been, been well covered, to, to be fair. I suppose one of the main concerns for me, and this is probably more to the Minister rather than, the, than Lorraine, um, is around the accountability and the fact that there is no ministerial responsibility. And, and I understand, and, and we've obviously got information around that but can I just check and excuse my ignorance but in terms of the government actually who are they who, who would they be accountable to and then for me that as I said that not having the ministerial responsibility I would have a wee bit of concern around accountability and, and how we, we would ensure that there is accountability in there because as I've made this point before that we as elected reps are very accountable and people don't like what we're doing, they can just get rid of us at any, any time they want. Um, they have that opportunity every every four to five years. But obviously others are, are employed and, and have all the rights to come with, with, with that and rightly so. But I think the accountability around elected representatives is good because we can be held to account and, and ministers can be held to account and I think that's really good. To have that, so how do we ensure the accountability and is not having ministerial um, responsibility to this actually the right way to go? Well, to be absolutely clear um, on that question, Linda, I have been very transparent um, about to clarify a particular conflict of interest arising from my husband's membership um, of a medical defence union. Accordingly, I asked the permanent secretary to make the key policy decisions. The decision that the legal framework for setting the rate should be changed, um, having been made by him, it is entirely proper to be, to be able to bring the bill that will implement that policy through the assembly as normal. And so you will have the usual opportunities to question me around why that decision was taken, how it was taken, and so on, even though it was not me who took the decision. Um, so it's not that there's no ministerial accountability for the process, it's simply that the two decisions that were um, where there could be pecuniary interest on my part would not be appropriate for me um, personally to make those decisions. Um, if further decisions arise during the passage of the bill and I direct any amendments, then I will obviously consider whether it's necessary for me to delegate those decisions to the Permanent Secretary. Um, if, for example, um, those really up to areas where there could be a perceived pecuniary interest. However, again, it would not prevent me coming to the Assembly Chamber and undertaking my proper role and being allowed um, to, to do that. If you look at the proposal that we have about putting these issues in the bill... Sorry, um, I apologise. Minister, sorry, I apologise for coming across you. And, uh, and maybe it's how I, ask, how I framed the question. I, I, I actually accept the issues around, around the... Yeah, wait, I was wait, about to come to the, the second part of the question, Linda. On, on, the, on the bell, okay. The, the, I was going to come to the second part of the question, and that's with respect to accountability for um, the legislation in the longer term. I mean, first of all, we're asking for accelerated passage. Um, we are not suggesting that we will be taking this through um, without um, a, an adequate um, space between each individual stage. I mean, as you know, accelerated passage a bill can be passed in 10 days. What we are proposing is that getting a new framework and stable discount rate in place is urgent, but I would still want sufficient time between stages to allow members the opportunity to digest the technical detail of the bill and inform the debate on it. So that will still be possible um, under accelerated passage. Um, there will still be opportunities to properly debate and scrutinise the bill and table amendments at consideration stage. So again, it doesn't preclude that oversight. And furthermore, the content of the bill itself, as Lorraine has explained, actually adds to the transparency and accountability. Because if we decide to make any adjustments or changes, um, either to the portfolio um, or to the rates, that will have to be brought back 
to the Assembly for further debate um, by way of legislation. So I think that in many ways there is more oversight on this um, as a result of the model which has been chosen um, uh, than would normally be the, the may be the case in the English and Welsh model. Um, and also I don't think that the um, accelerated passage in itself um, is de denying the opportunity for scrutiny, though it obviously um, removes the committee scrutiny element. It certainly doesn't, for example, prevent scrutiny and indeed amendment and, and so on uh, when it comes to consideration and further consideration stage. Um, but just uh, I think the, the, the key issue is that in the long term, um, the issue around the government actually uh, making changes um, is something um, that will that will have to be brought to the committee um, and to the assembly if there were any changes going to be made. So in that respect, you do have oversight of any changes that are proposed. Um, Lorraine, uh, do you want to maybe uh, answer the question just specifically on the government actuary um, and their departmental responsibilities? The government actuary uh, is a non-ministerial department. It comes under the, the umbrella of the Treasury. Uh, and I think the, the, the chief government actuary probably reports to the, the permanent secretary um, in the Treasury, but it, but it is a non-ministerial department. Uh, and they have indicated that they are um, content, uh, more than content, to help the Northern Ireland Executive in, in this legislation. Okay. Um, so my, my, my question was more about uh, in terms of the actual um, set, you know, setting of the rate going forward and, and the ministerial accountability around that rather than, than some of the other issues, that, to be fair, that the the minister has raised, but um, well, it won't necessarily be me that will be minister either, Linda. Bear in mind, so no, 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 you know, I, I if you refuse, there may not be a conflict, in which case it would be for the minister to bring the bill forward. Um, but it will have scrutiny in the assembly because it won't be able to be done other than via legislation. Okay, okay, fair I, enough. I think you. maybe part of the question was about whether the minister should have a role in actually setting the rates. It was, if I understood correctly. Um, and I think that, that there are alternative options. The England and Welsh model provides for the Lord Chancellor to make the decision based on um, the work of a panel of experts. Um, I think our, our view and the reason that we've um, drafted the bill in the way we have is that um, it, it's not clear on what basis a, a political figure should change uh, the, uh, the decision reached by the independent expert, in this case the government actuary, if the government actually decides that a certain level will deliver 100% uh, compensation, uh, then uh, what would the basis be on which there would then be a political decision taken to change that? So again, in the purposes of transparency, uh, so that all parties uh, to any court case would understand absolutely clearly how a decision was reached, in this case based purely, as I say, on that independent assessment then we believe that is a more satisfactory approach than one that allows um, the minister, it gives, it, gives, it gives accountability, but it's not clear on what basis any minister could then intervene to change that rate. Okay, I, I, accept, I accept what you're saying, Peter, to a degree. We haven't had a great experience of independent oversight in the Assembly whenever we've had it on some occasions, so that maybe that's what makes me a bit... A bit so, nervous, but that's of, not of, of course, the way this will work is that the rate will be set, and then the analysis, the way this will work is as, as cases are settled, so people will be able to judge, and if they believe there is a problem, then in exactly the way that you would expect, that would then come back to the department. The department could either change, choose to change, have a review, um, in other words, to have a review before the five-year period if it was concerned, or if it was convinced there was a problem, it could look at either the notion of portfolio, if that seemed to be the cause of the problem, uh, or at, at uh, the, the half percent margin, if that appeared to be the cause of the problem, and bring proposals to the Assembly to make a change. So in that way, there would be ministerial accountability for the system that is put in place. It's just the way in which the rate is set and the fact that that then goes um, and really needs to be properly a matter for the courts to determine in terms of the cases that are uh, before it. That's the bit that, that there isn't a, a political role in. And I think that, if I may say so, I think that is the right way to look at it. I, 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 okay, I accept that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Peter and, and Minister. 
Right, thank you, Linda. Paul Free. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your time and your your uh, answers so far. Uh, on that last point, Peter, I suppose between the actuary and versus the political decision of the rate has that, and, and I get why that that dilemma is there. That question is there with regards to actuary or political decision. But has that been extended into the actual political processing of producing law? And is that one of the reasons why you're going for extended, uh, 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 sorry, fast passage through the legislature? The only reason for accelerated passage is to try to resolve the uncertainty that exists at the moment so that uh, those who are um, in, in the middle of cases on, on whichever side have a solid basis on which to resolve them. Uh, the ministers explained that we are aware that there are a number of cases that we can't quantify them, uh, where there, there, has, there is currently a delay and that is undesirable. And I think the committee has drawn that out in previous engagements that they've had with us about the, about the bill. So, so I get the urgency and the, the duty on you to produce something as quickly as possible. But that can't be, so quickly as possible can mean many things with regards to a process that you're going through. And what you're doing is you're, you're leaving out the scrutiny piece of a committee with regards to that quickly as possible. Um, and I get the duty about doing it as quickly to get, uh, you know, to get people certainty. But with regards to the number, which you can't quantify, of cases going through, surely you, can you not have it within your remit to get the quantum who've, who've actually listed cases so far? Well, the issue, Paul, with respect, isn't that we, you can't tell what stage cases are at. Um, so it, knowing that there are cases that are live doesn't give you any indication of how close that case might otherwise be to settling. That would only be known by the individual parties. So some of the cases that will be um, that will be in negotiation at the moment um, will not be ready to settle even were there to be um, a new rate set. Others may have agreed everything bar um, the, the settlement on the basis that they don't want to agree at this stage without that in place. We would have no insight into what stage those cases are at, nor would we be expected to, because it's entirely a private matter between the two parties. So we can't provide the kind of information I think that you're seeking in terms of how many cases may be affected. In terms of speeding up the process, the only part of the process that we can really speed up um, in terms of delivery um, we are looking to speed up and that is first of all um, passing through um, the assembly process um, and we're looking to do that with pace but not I, I think not cutting out all opportunity um, for scrutiny and engagement on this I think that's important because I recognize the important role that the committee has in scrutinizing this but we're also looking for example at working with the government actuary um, in advance so that we are able to deliver um, hopefully in less than 90 days but at a maximum of 90 days, um, the actual decision in terms of, of the rate um, to allow us then um, to be able to move to a stable position as quickly as possible. So where we have been able to do things quickly, that's what we're seeking to do. And those are two areas at this stage where we can again make savings in terms of time um, and without a huge loss in terms of scrutiny. Because as I say, I mean, the minimum period I think is 10 days. We're not aiming to go through in that 10 day period. Um, because we recognise that the committee will want to reflect and may have um, a wish um, to bring issues forward um, at consideration and further consideration stage, and we want to try to accommodate that, albeit um, with accelerated passage. So, can I also say, sorry, just can I also say that, that people aren't going to set their cases down for trial if there if there's this big outstanding issue about the statutory discount rate. So it's, it's not just really a matter of saying what, what cases are listed, because you're not going to list it. So, so given, given the delays in our court system presently, would it not be unwise not to list as soon as possible in order to get to the other side of that court process more sufficiently and quicker? That, so but mo most of these cases are, are, are going to be settled without being heard in court. Right. Um, I think if you were a plaintiff, 
you would be making haste slowly because you don't want to settle your case or have your case disposed of with the current rate set under Wells and Wells. So, so it's not a case then that, that court processes or cases are delayed, it's it's the delay seems to be in moving them, is that, enlisting them, is that correct? Well, no, it's, it's, a matter between, them. It's, it's a matter between two private individuals. It's not like a criminal case where, you know, a case is driven um, by the state, by the police, the prosecution. You, you've got two private individuals and how quickly or how slowly they move with their case is more under their control. Now, there is case management of it and it, the, the court would want to know how is this case progressing, but it's not the same as in a criminal case where the, where the, the judge is going to um, want to drive the case on and where there's more state ownership of the progress of the case. I think the key issue, Paul, um, in respect of your question is that the impact that this has in terms of not um, being in a position um, to be able to meet the requirement of 100% compensation um, is that victims are not settling their cases um, because they are fearful that if they do they will be undercompensated and these can be life-changing sums of money so it's understandable uh, entirely understandable and justifiable that they would be concerned about that the only way we can move from that position to a more stable position where people can then progress their cases based on the case progression normal um, the normal circumstance and not influenced by this is to get to a point where we have a stable rate which is recognised to deliver that 100% compensation and that's why it's so important that we get to that point quickly. So it's not really about the business of the courts as much as it is about delivering the compensation to those who have been affected um, and who are entitled to compensation and that's really where the delay lies rather than in the courts. Minister, you say that you'll not use a 10 day period between stages. What is a sufficient time between stages then? Well, it's not about saying what is sufficient time. I'm simply pointing out that the minimum time is 10 days. Uh, we would obviously want to make swift progress. I think it's important that we do. Um, but we would obviously anticipate there being a week, uh, you know, a few weeks between each stage in order to give members the opportunity to engage properly with the bill and with scrutiny, both in, um, in, both at, uh, the, in the Assembly Chamber and indeed if there are amendments that are to be brought at consideration or further consideration stage. <laughs> So, so what you're saying is that you will want MLAs to scrutinise a bill without the support and the structure of, of the committee structure. And, and if, this, if that is the case, is there not danger there, Minister, that MLAs may well come totally uninformed and may well move amendments that may, in haste or by mistake, be detrimental to your bill? and to the outcome of the legislation, what you're trying to do. And what would your stance be then, whenever you could stand up on the assembly floor and say, you, you are, you're wrong to bring this amendment because you have not scrutinised it properly? Well, I mean, the, the fundamental issue here is that for every piece of legislation, the committee plays a crucial role in scrutiny, but it is for every MLA before they vote and participate in the debates. Um, and in the votes to scrutinise that legislation. That is part of our role as members of the Assembly and we have a duty to do that. Um, I have faith that members of the Assembly will make the effort to do so if they're going to participate actively in those debates and particularly if they're going to bring forward any kind of changes or amendments um, that they would um, engage with the Department about those and discuss those uh, with the Department in advance which is why I've said we're not talking here um, about 10 days. We are talking about having um, sufficient time between stages to give members adequate opportunity to, to digest the technical detail of the bill and inform um, the debate on it. But just to be clear, that, that wouldn't actually be a formal committee fu uh, function. Uh, the, the, the committee may well dip in to aspects of this bill, but they wouldn't have a formal committee stage. So, That's so, correct. So, so the work that the committee could do as a whole would be quite limited at, in regards to that? Of course, and that is, that is the downside of accelerated passage, which is why in my opening remarks I said I would only use it um, in what were extraordinary circumstances, that it's not something I anticipate having to use again in this mandate. Um, and it's not something, as you well know, that I would be um, keen on using 
um, in other circumstances were it not as urgent as this is. Um, I think it is clear um, the degree to which I value the committee input into legislation, um, given that, for example, uh, when it came to the domestic abuse um, bill, that we didn't piggyback that on the Westminster legislation in order to ensure that local MLAs and the committee had the opportunity to help shape that bill. And I think it is better for um, the, for the work that was put in. So this wouldn't be something that I would say as a routine matter. I recognise um, the importance of committee scrutiny. And as someone who sat on committees for a long period of time, um, I, I value the work that committees do. And I think it's important. It is, though, an issue about urgency. And the accelerated procedure mechanism is there for circumstances such as this. Um, this is exactly what it was designed for, for bills that are highly technical in nature, that are unlikely um, to generate um, a lot of amendments and changes because of their technical nature um, and that are required to be delivered with um, a degree of urgency that perhaps doesn't apply to other legislation. So in that sense, it fits the bill for um, going through under accelerated passage, um, but it doesn't in any shape or form create a precedent or undermine the value of the work that the committee do on other pieces of legislation and indeed you have two um, substantive pieces of legislation with you at the moment and I'm looking forward to engaging you in future meetings over those. J j uh, final question, Minister. Just on the court processes, do you have a percentage of, of, of rate uh, or speed of the court process currently compared to what it was this time last year? Is it running at 50%, 30% capacity? Well, in terms of, these would be um, civil court issues. In terms of criminal courts, um, we've actually been running above 100%. Um, over the last number of months in terms of the, the work to try to clear the backlog. So, <coughs> pardon me, um, we've been working very hard to do that, given the current pandemic and the impact that that's been having in terms of pressures on people. Um, we have had to step that down slightly in order to allow all sections of the system um, to continue to fully function um, and not um, lose any of the detailed consideration given to victims and the support um, and so on around that. But we're still functioning at um, over 100% of the capacity um, in terms of cases going through in order that we not only deal with new cases, but we also tackle the backlog that was created when the courts were shut for a period of time uh, whilst we COVID-proof them um, for future, for future um, work. And in civil court then? In civil court, I don't have those figures because um, I, I have the others um, from recall because we were actually dealing with um, the Criminal Justice Board last week. So I, I have those figures to hand, um, but I can certainly give you it in terms of civil. But as I say, in this case, the issue isn't so much um, driven by court capacity. It's driven um, entirely by the willingness um, of the two parties um, to reach a settlement. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Sure. Um, just a quick query, and then I'll bring in Rachel Woods. Um, is there any risk of the executive, the assembly, going down a different route around the Scottish model, and then the Treasury saying that um, you you pick up the tab, you've deviated from the English and Welsh model? Um, if I can answer that, um, no, I don't believe so, um, because Scotland has been able to introduce um, their model, so it is one of a range of options, and we're not deviating from the principle, which is to deliver 100% um, compensation, and we're still doing that within the within the reasonableness confines um, of what's required of us, so I don't anticipate that being an issue. Rachel Wood. Hi Chair, sorry, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can now, yeah. Perfect, thank you. Um, Minister and um, Peter and Lorraine, thank you very much um, for coming here today. I really appreciate it. One of my questions was about the Treasury and that has been asked, but just with regard to the letter dated 19th of January, um, it's clear that the assessment is for the bill to become law and a new rate to be set before the Assembly term. And that's regardless of whether accelerated passage is granted. If, is that correct? Yes. Okay. So just just with the information that we have in the in the letter, the difference between accelerated passage and normal procedure for the bill would be a rate set around autumn twenty twenty one or early twenty twenty two. 
Obviously, we can't, we can't determine how quickly the Assembly will conclude the process uh, in the event that there is a committee stage. So we have to make a, a projection as to how long that would be. We can say with some certainty that the legislation will be passed before the summer under accelerated passage. And then in less than 90 days after that, we would be able to proceed. So no later than the early autumn, we would have a, a rate in place. It's much harder for us to determine at what point the legislation would actually pass uh, were there not to be accelerated passage and then to add on the extra time for the uh, actuary after that. Uh, but you're right, it, it's unlikely to be before early 2022. It could be a bit later than that. Okay. Thank you. Um, is it possible for the bill to go through normal procedure, i.e. to have a committee stage much quicker than it's been suggested, and for the rate to be set around autumn this year without accelerated passage? I don't believe it's possible to have a committee stage and meet the kind of timeframes that we would be talking about with accelerated passage, no, which is why we're seeking um, accelerated passage um, and I think that's one of the reasons that we have we have brought this um, request um, to the committee. Um, so I, I don't think it is possible um, to do it as quickly with the committee stage, um, just given um, the strictures that are around that. Okay. Just with regard um, to the, I suppose the technical nature it was referred to earlier on, it's a highly technical um, and this is what um, accelerated passage could be used for if there was urgency. It's just... We're obviously creating a new legislative framework for setting rates and it's a very important and complex exercise and I don't even claim to know all of the details in this. Um, but it is, we're talking about a legal framework that will shape a process and future procedure and it's not simply about a calculation or a formula to produce numbers. Um, and that is, you know, this legislation will have lasting effects. And that is, I, whilst I appreciate that there is some you know, fine detail in this, the, the Scottish Parliament introduced their damages bill on the 1st of June 2010, and it was scrutinised by the Finance Committee and then Subordinate Legislation Committee, and then passed first stage six months later in December. And then at the second stage of the bill, the Scottish Justice Committee considered 17 amendments, um, and it was referred back to again, and many of these amendments were made, and the bill final stage in, in March 2011, so nine months after it was introduced. So just think the Scottish example is important because it showed that the devolved legislator had a big role in refining and improving the legal framework as the bill through, went through normal stages. So I suppose my question would be just, I know it, it, is, it is refined and it's detailed and it's complex, but do you think that opportunities to refine or improve the bill could be lost as a result of not having the committee stage? Well, I think that there are two elements to that, Rachel. I think, firstly, um, the Scottish model has been tested through the Scottish Assembly, and whilst I'm not suggesting for a moment that that in any way supplants the right of the Northern Ireland Assembly to look at its own business, um, there has been a degree of testing and stress testing around this. You also mentioned the dates, and you'll be conscious that we're now um, a long way beyond um, those dates when, when this legislation was brought through in Scotland. Um, the situation has been corrected in England and Wales um, following Wales versus Wales um, and we are still behind. So we come from a position we're already behind time-wise um, and under significant pressure to address this, which is one of the reasons why uh, we're keen um, to move forward as quickly as we can um, in order to right this position um, to what our duty is. So, I mean, will there be um, opportunity for um, people to bring amendments and to be able to seek out the technical detail? Well, as I've said in answer to previous questions, I still, I still think that opportunity is available um, and there's certainly nothing to stop members doing that. However, again, given the highly technical nature of it, um, I think there has to be some um, restraint shown in terms of um, the degree to which people would wish to seek to amend um, legislation of this nature going through, given that it is carefully balanced um, and that professional advice has been sought with respect to the content. But there it will still be that opportunity that will not be removed. And I have already said that I would expect there would be sufficient time between each stage, albeit through accelerated passage, um, for members to consider they wish to bring amendments um, or make recommendations for change to the bill and the department will of course be happy to work with members um, of the committee and indeed other members of the assembly um, who have issues or queries or indeed um, suggestions for change um, during that process. 
Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Chair. Right, thanks, Rachel. Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just one quick point. Um, just as I'm listening to the presentation and the answer here, and I, and I genuinely appreciate it. But in terms of um, the, you know, being able to fully understand what it is that's being proposed. And it has been said that we don't know a lot of this until the numbers run through the system. And I wonder if the department have considered um, putting their bill as proposed in front of the government actuary and saying, you know, as much as we already have established a notional portfolio, to run through the system a notional settlement amount and be able to make a comparison um, to how that final figure would land in the Scottish model as opposed to the tweaked or changed proposed model for Northern Ireland? We did have some discussion um, about GAD with that, but I think they, they're reluctant to run um, the, the, the portfolio uh, until the, the actual time for running it because it is so um, market dependent. So. Even if, if we they gave us a number um, this week, by the time the bill is enacted, it, it could be a different number. So there's a question of, you know, if they did that, what would, what would we use that information for? We know when it was run in Scotland, uh, 2019, it was it brought out 0.75 percent, um, but the, the market has changed since. So. Uh, I mean, none of us are any experts, but, but, but we could assume um, it would be a higher rate than that. Sorry, Lorraine, I was thinking more from a settlement perspective. You know, we've taken largely the Scottish model, but we've adapted it in a way that we have extended the number of years for the investment. So I'm saying about, you know, if I had a settlement reached today and then I use the, you know, the discount rate, what would my actual settlement look like? based on our model or proposed model as opposed to the Scottish model. So even though, you know, they're both at a point in time, so even though next week it may look different, if they both are run through in tandem at a point in time, yeah. it allows me as MLA to know what the differential is I'm agreeing to or not agreeing to. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, yes, I'm, I understand now if, you, if we just <coughs> ran the Scottish model now against 30 years or against 43 years, would it make any difference or, or yeah. Um, we'll see if the, the government actually could give us an indication on that, but actually asking them to, to undertake that exercise could take several weeks. Thank you, I appreciate that, Lorraine, but I do think it would be worth doing to bring some clarity to it, you know, because it is a complex, um, you know, run through, so I'd appreciate it would give that realistic outcome. What we're comparing. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Minister. You'd indicated that you know accelerated passage. This fitted the, the fitted fitted the criteria because it's technical in nature. Uh, maybe I'm misquoting you on that, but who who sets the criteria for what what fits the bill for accelerated passage? Is there any? Well, I mean. I think it is designed for those bills which are less likely um, to require um, significant change and less likely to be subject to significant change on their way through. I think it's also for matters that are of a highly urgent nature. Um, and for that reason, it fulfills, if you like, those criteria. It's not set down in law. It's simply a common sense assessment of the purpose um, of um, accelerated passage, because obviously in the vast majority of cases as ministers, we would prefer that these things went through the normal legislative process. But the accelerated passage route is offered um, as an option. Um, for the Assembly and Ministers to consider because there will be circumstances um, in which there is an urgency to the legislation that needs to be passed. This is such um, a circumstance um, where we are both behind the curve, <coughs> pardon me, um, in terms of the situation in the UK, but also um, where we have uh, a desire um, and a duty um, to ensure that people um, are compensated at 100% um, and that we can, we need to reach that point as rapidly as possible. So in that sense, I think it is a good fit for, for reasons of accelerated passage. And as I've said, it's not something that for me um, would be a routine matter that I would want to see other issues pass via accelerated passage. But I do think that this is an exceptional case. 
Yeah, I suppose I, I'm just trying to find out where where the executive policy stipulates the criteria for accelerated passage, and if that includes something which is technical, um, but hasn't actually had any indication from the scrutiny committee that it actually supports the policy position. Um, it, it doesn't strike me as neatly fitting into the accelerated passage, in my opinion, but that's where it comes into a subjective one, and I suppose what I'm trying to ask, is this your subjective criteria for Yes, it is my passage? view. It is, so it's, it not, is my view. it's not an executive position then? No, I haven't said that it was either. Okay, well you talked about colleagues in the plural, it wasn't singular. Sorry? You talked. You referenced colleagues, as in ministerial colleagues, in the plural. It wasn't a singular reference. Not with respect to that issue, I don't believe, uh, Chairman. Okay. So j just to summarise, I suppose, some of the key questions that I, I would like to have had answered to justify accelerated passage. One, I still don't know how many cases are being delayed, but we do know. I know of some that are, but we, we don't know what that is. We don't know the financial impact on what the executive will be. Um, we don't know if the executive will have access to Treasury reserves, but we do know that this committee raised it with the Finance Minister and has subsequently now engaged with the Treasury um, to, to indicate that they would want to have access, but we don't know a response to that. We don't know the financial impact of moving from 30 years to 43 years, which deviates from the Scottish model. We don't know the impact on the insurance industry, businesses and consumers. You know, and, and for example, should the market be reduced, insurance premiums increased, then you could have reduced cover or no cover at all to claim against for injury, and yet you want accelerated passage. So yes, because Mr. Mr. Chairman, absolutely, because none of those are considerations that we can legally take into account in setting the rate. Our duty is singular, and it is that we have to provide 100% compensation to victims. All of the other matters which you have raised, whilst they may be of wider interest, are not allowed to influence the decision we take um, around setting this rate. And so we cannot and should not and must not, and actually, if the committee are to be involved in scrutiny of this, they must not either be veering into issues around sustainability of the insurance industry, the impact on the executive's finances, or any of those other issues. Those are matters that are solely matters for others. Um, to respond to our responsibility and our sole responsibility in this bill is to ensure that we achieve the objective of 100% compensation. Nothing else can influence our decision making. So it isn't that there has been a lack of attention or awareness um, of the challenges um, that setting a rate um, might, uh, might have on other parts of the executive um, or indeed um, on other industries. However, it isn't something that we can take into account. So we may be aware of it as an issue, but we cannot take into account, and it wouldn't be appropriate um, for us to do so. Yes, but in this discussion, we have already identified that the English and Welsh model, at its core, is about 100% compensation, no more, no less, as in Scotland. However, that does produce different results. So, so has the executive and the finance minister, the health minister, all considered, debated... Um, the framework which you have now said is a purely isolationist position that your department is taking and not taking into consideration the impact on the Department of Finance or the Department of Health, for example. Ha have those ministers fully engaged in this and considered the outworkings of it for them? Or is the executive just operating now in silos again? Well, I mean, again, Mr Chairman, I think you misrepresent the position entirely. This is not a matter of us operating in silos or the Department of Justice taking an isolationist position. This is about the legal duty on the Department of Justice, which is to ensure 100% compensation. And we are precluded from considering all of those other issues. Were we to be lobbied um, by any other minister on, in respect of the cost of the executive or anything else, and were we to allow such considerations to influence our decision, we would be acting outside of our responsibility and our duty um, to which we're legally obliged to stick. So it's not about silos. It's not about people not being aware of the issues. Um, I have raised the issue of the personal injury discount rate at executive. Other ministers have had the opportunity to discuss the impact that it may have on them. Um, but they fully understand and recognise 
that that is not a conversation to which I can be party, nor is it a conversation which can influence any of the decision making in respect of setting the rate. And it would be wrong to categorise that as a decision of the department. It is simply our legal, our legally bound duty. And in the meantime, to deal with the urgency of this, um, the current law allows your permanent secretary to strike an interim rate. Yes, but that doesn't, um, with respect, that would not put us in a position where we have a settled position. In your opinion. So, for example, were we to set an interim rate at this point, it would still have to be based on Wales versus Wales. Um, were we to do so, we know that that would not achieve um, the objective of 100% compensation, that it could lead to overcompensation. And the result of that would not be to address the issue of claims actually being able to be settled, but would simply lead to a, a reversal where it were it was defendants um, who did not wish to settle the claims because of fear that they would be overcompensating. They would also know that it is our intention, um, as it is right across the rest of the UK, for us to come into line and change um, the, the mechanism for setting the legal framework and the mechanism for setting the rate um, in the future. And so they would know it isn't a settled position. And so they would then just decide, as indeed um, victims have decided, that it would not be in their interest to settle until that settled position has been um, uh, has been reached. Which is why it is so important um, that we make these changes now and that we move forward um, as quickly as possible. And that is the only reason why we're seeking accelerated passage in this particular case. Okay, is there any other members want to speak? If everyone else is content then in terms of their queries. Minister, can I thank you and um, Peter and Lorraine in terms of your contribution? I've noted that <coughs> despite recusing yourself, you spoke extensively <laughs> and the Secretary of State or the, the permanent secretary hardly spoke at all, despite him being now legally responsible for this. But however, I'll, I'll just note that. Well, for Mr. The S uh, Mr Chairman, this is an important distinction and I set it out clearly um, in answer to the Vice Chairman's question. I have not recused myself from this entire subject matter. I am still fully across the detail of what is taking place. I will still be the person who will take the bill through the assembly processes. So I have not recused myself in that sense. Where I have recused and delegated um, decision making is around two very key decisions. Um, and they are key, but there are two decisions that do have a perceived um, pecuniary interest uh, on my part and therefore it would not be appropriate for me um, to be involved in those decisions and that is uh, with respect to the setting of any interim rate um, and with so the actual rate itself um, and with respect to choosing um, the, the formal legal structures that will be used um, to achieve the rate because were I to be involved in that there could be a perceived pecuniary interest um, and it would not be appropriate but with respect to the rest of this and in particular um, the urgency of delivering 100% compensation there is no pecuniary interest and there is no conflict of interest and there is no problem with me speaking on that matter. In your opinion. So thank you very much Minister and Peter and Lorraine. Your time has been appreciated with the committee. Okay members, um, so in terms of uh, consideration of this issue, obviously I'm keen to hear from members in respect of this um, as to, to what you wish to do. Is there any members have a view then in terms of the accelerated passage request? No. <laughs> Chair, if I can come in there whilst uh, we have that vacuum of silence, which is sometimes welcome. Uh, can I just say I'm still deeply nervous about the committee giving a view on accelerated passage. Uh, I think that our job is to scrutinise legislation. Um, the Assembly can do what it wants, the Assembly can do what it sees fit. <coughs> this committee is here to scrutinise legislation that was brought forward by the relevant department, which is the Department of Justice, and I think I would be neglecting my duty if I wasn't able to uh, scrutinise this with all the support mechanism that, is, that sits around us as a committee, uh, and that's my stance. 
Thank you, Paul. Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Chair. Chair, I did find it particularly helpful, I have to say, having that session with the department um, did focus, um, you know, some perspective, I suppose, from their, you know, uh, view that they do have a duty to, to act on this. And I've no doubt an accelerated passage is not something that politically I would ever encourage or, or reach to. It's a very, very reluctant last two. And I do wonder, um, and I genuinely would have concerns about the timeline outside of an accelerated passage equally, because I do think, can it be achieved? And would it be achieved? Um, because if it is technical in nature and we start drilling down into that, it could take time. And the more I look into this and research into it, there's absolutely no exact science around this. You know, there's not. But I do think we need to have clarity on what exactly it is we're being asked to support in the form of any bill. But I'm not sure, um, I'm not even sure procedurally whether a committee view, you know the minister was hopeful to take a committee view on accelerated passage, passage to the executive office. And I'm not sure, is that is that the normal process that would be used? Would it be that a, a minister would try to carry that into an executive office to indicate either way whether there was support for it or not. Well, I'll get I'll get Christine just to speak about the that procedure in a moment, but you do raise a, a valid point and one one which the official committee position so far has been unable to actually indicate whether or not it supported the Scottish model, um, despite the engagement with the department, um, uh, and the committee hasn't been able to reach a view. Obviously the minister confirmed that she took the decision to press ahead um, without having a committee position on this um, to get executive approval to uh, have instructions for the legislation to be drafted upon a minority position of the consultees, which was the Scottish model. That's a decision that she has taken. Um, so uh, in that respect, you know, people are being asked to indicate their view on granting accelerated passage upon a bill which is predicated upon a policy that we haven't actually reached a view on. Um, and therein lies the difficulty because um, members would need to consider that if you don't support accelerated passage, do you actually still support the bill coming through the normal uh, scrutiny processes of the Assembly? And I don't think the committee has still reached a position as to whether or not it believes that the, the framework identified by the department is the best way to go. But Christine, do you want to just do you know the, the procedures in terms of does the minister require executive approval for accelerated passage or does she just introduce the bill? And then ultimately, my understanding is it's the assembly that has to vote. There would be a motion seeking accelerated passage. Yes, um, I'll be honest with you, I don't know the executive process, but I do know that the minister has to seek executive approval to introduce the bill. So I would assume that they would consider the accelerated passage request at the same time. Um, I'm not sure if the executive indicated they weren't content with accelerated passage. I, I honestly don't know that, Sinead, because we don't know how the executive works um, and their things. But the minister, in relation to the assembly, um, has done what she's required. She has to come to the relevant statutory committee before she introduces the bill um, to put her case. Um, and then after introduction of the bill before second stage, she has to put down a motion um, to the Assembly seeking accelerated passage, and that is voted on in the Assembly. Um, and depending on the outcome of that vote, um, sets how the bill then proceeds through the Assembly. Okay. I'm not sure, Sinead, if you're welcome. Thank you, Christine, yeah. and thanks, Chair, for that. Because, because I do think, you know, the Minister and the Department's officials did make a really good point in when they said about the duty on them. And we naturally do, and, you know, we look at stakeholders and we look at all the, the ripple effects of this. But I suppose if we're pure about it in terms of a justice committee and we recognise there is a duty on the Department to do this, um, we should be measuring it in that scale and perhaps not allowing ourselves to be overly distracted um, by those considerations outside of it. However, that said, it's, it's still the, the proposal that's on the table that I don't 
fully understand. And I think the details that, um, like for example, what I requested from Noreen and you know, maybe getting the actuaries department to run it through, because only then can we actually compare it to what's being used elsewhere to see are we achieving the objective, which is to reach 100% compensation. And I know that's me getting pulled into the detail of the bill as opposed to the, the accelerated passage for the bill, but the two are so connected, it's hard to separate them at this point. They are. I would, I'd, I'd concur with that. Um, you know, I, I would like to, <laughs> I would like to find out what this legal duty is that the department referenced, because um, again, it seems subjective by what, in, in the same context that the minister has decided what criteria should be used to justify accelerated passage. Um, there is a duty on the department to strike a rate, and there's been an interim rate proposed, which the permanent secretary could strike, and that would. Um, in terms of the current urgency of cases, may well alleviate that. Um, that. That's the current legal duty placed upon the department, which is to deal with a framework under Wells v Wells. And I acknowledge that that's not the perfect framework, but my understanding is that that is the current legal duty applicable to the department, um, and that's the one that they're operating in, which currently they are not taking forward, hence the legal challenges that are now proceeding through the courts in respect of that. But I know the Minister doesn't want to take into account all of the other consequences of this. Uh, uh, that's not a view that I take, and when I asked, and members have asked questions around the financial impact of all of this on a whole range of areas, the move from 30 years to 43 years, we're not getting the information, uh, and uh, I, I don't see how I could support accelerated passage. Um, in terms of what could be the potential outworkings, very significant financial outworkings um, for the executive in respect of that issue. Um, and we are deviating from the Scottish model by moving from 30 to 43 years. So this is not a copy, cut and paste in respect of that. I do share some of the concerns Linda articulated around um, not having a form of ministerial accountability in terms of striking the rate, because um, I, I always feel that it is, it is better to have that level of accountability um, in, in a process. So, you know, I'm not in a position to say that I support the Scottish model, but I'm definitely not in a position to be indicating my support for accelerated passage. Any other members want to indicate? Um, let me just. Sorry, Linda Dillon. Sorry, Chair, my, I don't have a hand raising function for some reason on, on my star yeah, leave, so okay. apologies. I'm, I'm, I'm waving at you and messaging Christine trying to get in. So just as well, I, I think the Minister gave me um, an answer probably to a question I wasn't asking. My question wasn't around around her recusing herself at all. It was it was actually about the bill and then how we go forward in terms of ministerial responsibility and, and accountability around this. So I'm still not a hundred percent sure you know, Peter did come in on that and, and give some kind of reassurances on it. I would like to dig deeper into it. Um and that makes me a bit nervous about accelerated passage because how do we dig dig deeper into things if we don't have the the opportunity to scrutinise, and um, that for me is is still the real issue. I just quickly on the que Sinead's question around the executive responsibility. I can't say a hundred percent, but I my understanding is that the executive don't agree or disagree to the actual accelerated passage, but the same in the same way as they would accelerate or would agree to the, the bill being brought for the Assembly, they would agree to whether the Minister can request accelerated passage. But I'm not 100% certain on that, Chair. It's probably something we want to find out. And just the last thing on, on the issue you've just raised, to be fair to the Department of Justice, I think they're right. They have to set this in terms of keeping to that very narrow remit of ensuring that claimants get 100% compensation but yes, as a committee, maybe we do have to give consideration to other things. So is there value in us writing to the the finance minister on this issue and getting a view? 
Yep, I have no problem in doing that. Um, Sinead, your hand is up. I just see, is that to come back in? Yeah. No, no. Sorry. No, you're okay. No <laughs> you're okay. Um, okay, well, I, I, in terms of my party's position, I think I've outlined that we're not in a position as members of this committee to be indicating our support or otherwise for the, the Scottish model because we have sought through the committee to get more information and the timeline that's been provided to members indicates how the committee has raised these issues, formally expressed a, a view um, that we weren't in a position to, to indicate our support for um, the, the, the Scottish proposals in that respect um, and there, therefore in terms of accelerated passage how could we support accelerated passage without, without having agreed yet to the actual Scottish policy framework? So that's the position that um, I and my two colleagues will be taking in terms of the, uh, a, a, if the committee is wanting to express a view. Ultimately, it's not this committee that votes on whether or not accelerated passage is granted. It's the Assembly. Yep. So if members don't want to express a committee view and leave it up, to the minister, the executive, and then a subsequent vote in the assembly, then that's fine. The, the, the committee can do that. Um, but for transparency purposes, I'm indicating very clearly the position that we'll be taking in respect of that as we go forward. I'm happy for a committee position to be relayed if it's if it's something similar to, to that or if there's other broader points that we need to be considered. Chair, can I just add to that um, at this moment in time that, you know, when I look at what's in front of us, I wouldn't, um, on behalf of the SDLP, go on record to say that accelerating the passage isn't the right thing to do. It may very well turn out that it is, but I've not been informed sufficiently to make that judgment call today. Okay. Thank you, Sinead. I'm not sure if um, Linda and Rachel want to comment any further in respect of that. Chair, no, I think um, you know my feelings on accelerated passage, regardless of what committee it is or what piece of legislation it is. Um, I just I don't I don't feel as if I have enough information to make a decision, and the um, it is inherently tied for me accelerated passage and the particulars of the bill. Um, so I, I I can't at the moment support um, accelerated passage given if there is going to be a rate set. Um, by accelerated passes by autumn, but potentially um, could be done by the normal route by early 2021. And I'm happy to facilitate that as much as I can um, in terms of offering scrutiny. Um, I would I would rather have the committee stage if possible. Yeah, okay. And Linda, do, do you want to come back in any further in terms of a position on the the substance of the bill and the request for accelerated passage? I suppose just to say, Chair, for the reasons that I've outlined, I would, I would be nervous about the, the route of accelerated passage. Um, I'm not going to take a, a party position. You're, you're right, the, the Assembly will have the opportunity to say we will decide well in advance of that. But I certainly wouldn't be um, at this stage thinking that we have the kind of information that we need to be able to say that this is something that we would feel very confident that accelerated passage is the right is the right route to go. So at this moment in time, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to declare a par an absolute party position on it, but accelerated passage is not something that I would be comfortable with because I just don't feel I have the information. Um, if I, as the, as the political lead on it, don't have the information, I, I certainly would be confident that anybody else in the, in the party or the assembly would have enough information on it to make a decision around that. Yeah. Okay. Paul? Yeah, just a very quick one. Something that struck me is that if, if you do away with the committee stage, it's gone. But you can have a committee stage that's both agile and, and suited with regards to timing of the actual bill in front of you. So if there's a bill with 300 clauses and a bill with five clauses, there's going to be a difference there with regards to your work and probably even the time. Now, if you find you're getting into that bill and there's something else you need to know, well, then that's a necessity. So that might well extend time. But there's no reason why we couldn't give, as a committee, the commitment 
to work through this as diligently and as quickly as possible. Uh, what we don't know is what we don't know at the present time, and we all have answer- We all have questions, and we haven't got the answers. That's what we don't have. But what we do have is the ability to work on this diligently and quickly. Leave it at that, Chief. Okay. Well, if members are content, what we'll do is um, we we can. Um, provide a summary of members' general commentary around their their views on this, um, recognising that ultimately that's a decision for the assembly to to reach in terms of the vote. But um, you know the committee can reflect uh, the the general views that have been expressed by individual members um, during this session, um, as opposed to an explicit committee position, um, and that's something then that the minister can take into account. Is that is that a way forward for folks? Yep, right. <clears throat> okay. Um, well, then we will we will write to the minister then, um, in terms of that, uh, outlining what members have indicated, um, and we'll copy in um, the executive ministers because obviously this is going to go to the other executive ministers um, in terms of some of their deliberations. Uh, as well, and I think it's helpful for them to be aware of some of the considerations that the committee has provided. Okay, let us move on. Okay, item six is the Covert Human Intelligence Sources Bill. Um, The Minister has written to advise that the Covert Human Intelligence Sources Bill as introduced related to reserved or expected matters, and as such the Department has had no role in the information of the legislation and will have no role in exercising the powers contained in it. However, an amendment that has been proposed by the Home Office would impact on the Northern Ireland Criminal uh, Injuries Compensation Scheme. Essentially, it would provide for the continued availability of Criminal Injury Compensation Scheme in respect of activities authorised on foot of a proposed amendment to the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act of 2000. The Minister um, is content with the proposed amendment. Home officials have been advised um, of the Minister's position and a legislative consent motion on this issue is not required from the Assembly. So it's more um, for noting for members today, if members are content to note the information. Right. Item 7. Uh, at our meeting on the 4th of June, the committee agreed that it was content with the proposal to extend the powers of courts in Northern Ireland to try certain uh, sexual and violent offences which have been committed abroad through the UK Domestic Abuse Bill by way of an LCM. Uh, the Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for Justice and the Minister for Safeguarding have recently written to the Minister of Justice advising of their intention to table further amendments to the extra territorial jurisdictions provisions. Part 1 of Schedule 2 to the Domestic Abuse Bill will be amended to ensure that UK nationals who commit marital rape abroad in a country where it is not an offence can be prosecuted in the courts in England and Wales. The Minister is content for the inclusion in the Bill of corresponding amendments to Northern Ireland provisions to enable prosecution in Northern Ireland courts in such circumstances and has advised that the proposed amendment does come within the scope of the LCM which was passed by the Assembly on the 23rd of June last year. So again, that's information just for members um, by way of noting. Item 8 uh, is the licensing and registrations of clubs issue, page 261 to 325. Uh, At our meeting on the 26th of November last year, committee considered correspondence from the Committee for Community seeking comments on the licensing and registration of clubs bill. The committee agreed to seek views of the Department of Justice and the police on the clauses to the bill relevant to their responsibilities, including the new offences, penalties and enforcement requirements, and whether there are any resource implications, and if so, how they would be met. Responses have been received. They are in the meeting pack. The Department indicating that it has been engaging with the Department for Communities on the development of the Bill, and the Minister of Justice gave her approval for the offences and penalties to be included. The police response indicates that it fully supports the offences and penalties and also makes a number of comments and proposals and highlights a range of issues including potential resource implications. So members, there is a um, draft response uh, from this committee to the Committee for Communities highlighting some of the key issues raised um, for your consideration. Um, If members are 
uh, content with that, we could send that uh, to the Committee for Communities um, by way of giving them uh, some kind of response from this committee. So Linda Dillon, um, uh, Rachel Woods and Emma Rogan. So Linda. Thank you, Chair. Um, just in relation to the Friday and Saturday night issue, Chair, and, and I accept that um, PSNA need to have some assurance around, in terms of personnel, around how many nights or days this, this would be in place, but the exclusion of Sundays, for me, would be an issue, because obviously on bank holiday weekends, Sundays are, are, I think, should be at least in, in consideration. So probably on that one, um, I'm not really content. I can understand the, the request around the one year came pilot. I get that, but the exclusion of Sundays for me would be an issue. Okay, um, Rachel Wood. Thanks, Chair. Um, yes, as you know, I did clarify and I just did this at the start um, and will do again. Um, but I wouldn't be able to support the line um, in terms of the um, request to ensure Friday and Saturday nights along with, uh, with Linda there. Um, it, it just, it's not practical um, for many of the businesses that this would apply to. But I, I do appreciate the police's response, but I wouldn't be able to say it would be in my view in terms of the committee um i couldn't support at this stage the inclusion of um the consideration to introduce a late night levy no information on this this hasn't been discussed before um and i don't see how that um could make its way into our committee response without um having evidence of what that actually means and what it looks like um, I also whilst I appreciate in terms of the PSNI's view and that remains their view about the longer hours associated with increased alcohol consumption towards closing up time and drinking up time, saying it may give rise to an increase in antisocial behaviour and on-street drinking. Um, I, I, would see, I could see how they could make that argument but I couldn't buy into that in terms of the committee um, as it would maybe displace. Um, already existing uh, perceived antisocial behaviour, so I can't, I don't know how you, you could say it would be a rise. Um, I'm not too sure about the one year trial either. Um, again, I don't know what that would look like, how that would be enforced, and who would be involved. Um, so I, could, I couldn't put, put my name to that, unfortunately. Um, I'm happy to certainly have that, that, you know, we've received the PSNI's viewpoints and that those are the viewpoints of the PSNI, but I wouldn't be able to put up my name towards those three issues just um, on the base of what I know of the industry and my previous comments on this bill at second stage. Okay, thanks Rachel. Emma Rogan. <coughs> Thanks, Chair. Um, look, um, something similar there to um, Rachel on the, the levy. My issue with it is um, licensed premises are already been struggling and have been do, done have done so um, probably since the onset of COVID. And I do think it would be unfair then to levy them to police the late night economy. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure how it would work in practice. I, I just don't think at this stage that it would be um, fair on, on those um businesses that are already struggling so much so we wouldn't be able to support that um going forward either okay um Sinead bradley thank you chair i'm sorry apologies i thought i had the hand raised there and i hadn't earlier and um, yes there there are the, the points have raised largely but i do think as well perhaps a lot of the background to this um maybe was stemming from a time sort of prior to covid in terms of the thinking and the drafting behind it and we all know that these businesses are really on their knees and struggling to survive and some of the proposals in here just won't wear you know in the new climate as we go forward so i do think it, it needs a fresh pair of eyes on it in this new context because you know we're going to be so dependent and um, 
on on the, the dikes of these businesses because you know these are in large part also um the base business to a lot of the tourist industries you know in areas like my own south down we depend on on that type of premises being operational and functioning and i could see how this could financially just cripple you know could be the last um the last piece to close the door on some premises so i would have deep concerns Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Don't think there's anybody else. Chair, I, I just oh, make a point or Gordon. two. In relation to the, the late opening, traditionally Sunday wouldn't be a the night for late licences. So I don't really see an issue there. Generally, it is a Friday or a Saturday night. And the police are obviously very supportive of, of having it limited to Friday and Saturday. And I think, you know, it, it's indicated in the report the the ongoing issues there are with, with alcohol. Alcohol abuse continues to be recognised as significant public health, community safety and social issue. So, you know, I think we're all supportive of that and I, I certainly for one would not be supporting the late licensing, going against the police recommendation for the late licensing on a Sunday. And um, I think it, it's Alcohol continues to be a serious problem. The, the misuse of alcohol and the easy access to it, and it's, it's available so easily now, especially for young people and the risks involved with And so many public representatives talk about the, the implications of it, but do very little to control it or use their influence on it. So this is an opportunity for us to use our influence to try and c control and limit the, the use and abuse of alcohol. And Chairman, I would not be supporting the late licence on a Sunday. Well, um, okay, so obviously, Member, there's a, a pretty wide view there <laughs> being expressed for members. Um, and at the end of the day, this is, this is being dealt with by the Communities uh, Committee. I'm quite happy that we just forward on the response from the PSNI, and that's something that the, that committee should consider in its scrutiny work. We as a Justice Committee don't need to be expressing, I suppose, an opinion in respect of that. So if members are just agreeable, we'll forward on the response that we have received uh, from the PSNI in respect of that, and the Communities Committee can um, kick that issue around them whenever they come to consideration. Chair, are we not being asked for a response in relation to this? Oh, yeah, they've asked for a response, Gordon, but we ultimately don't need to indicate, I suppose, a, a formal view on it. Um, Linda and then Rachel. Sorry, Chair. You're okay. Um, yeah, I, I contend that it's forwarded on, but I think that we need to make it clear that it's not a view that's supported by the committee. That this is not a committee view, and we don't we don't actually have a committee view. I think we need to make that clear, just in case there's any misunderstanding when it goes to communities that. That this is a justice committee view, or that we support it in any way. So I think we just need to be very clear about that. You know, accepting that what Gordon says, there's a there's a there's a, a wide and varied, um, those wide and there are wide and varied views in relation to this, and and there's no <coughs> agreed committee view. I think that everybody would be more content if we were very clear with the communities committee that there is no justice committee view on this or agreement on this. Okay. Um, Rachel? Thanks, Chair. I think um, no, the first part of the response has been put up just with regard to putting the Department of Justice. Um, the position is, is quite straightforward. I think it's the, it, for me, it's the, us potentially supporting what the PSNI has said. I think we could, we could forward that on and, 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 and we've noted it. Um, obviously, there will be no great position, but just to confirm that the late licences are not just extending to a Sunday. This would be any nights of the year, um, and particularly important um, again, declaring an interest in previous life running events and music nights. So it's not just about a Sunday; it's about any particular night of the week, um, and any time that any late licence is. Um, is, is going to happen. It, it, the police are aware of that. You, that those provisions are already in in place. So I, I mean, I, I would be content for the first section of that draft response to go, with, highlighting the department's response, and then and also the PSNI then, and that the, the committee can do, doesn't have an agreed stance on it. Just for, for noting, I think that could be worked in. 
Okay, thank you. Well, listen, I'll bring in the clerk whose um, draft effort has certainly stimulated a lot of consideration. Christine? <laughs> yeah, I think um, if the committee's content, what we'll do is we'll just highlight that the committee sought um, the views of the department and the PSNI and having received them is forwarding them on for the department of community or the committee for communities consideration and that's probably the easiest way and that deals with any um, concerns that it suggests this committee has formed a view on any of it. Okay. So listen, I, 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 I'm happy enough that we, we're, we're saying that we haven't taken a view on it but we're providing the information to them for, for them so if members are content then we'll do that. All right. Reluctantly, yeah. All right. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, um, item nine, the explosives uh, appointment of authorities and enforcement amendment, EU exit regulations 2021. Department's proposing to make a uh, statutory rule to make minor amendments to the explosives regulations 2015 order to implement the Northern Ireland Stroke Ireland Protocol and the withdrawal agreement. The rule is subject to the negative uh, resolution procedure. The 2015 uh, regulations are required to be amended to ensure that they continue to operate effectively in Northern Ireland after the end of the implementation period. Minor amendments will replace references to Member State with an appropriate term that includes Northern Ireland only uh, and an EEA State. The rule will also ensure that the uh, CLP regulation, which sets out internationally accepted definitions and criteria to identify the hazards of chemicals, and requires duty holders to classify, label and package hazardous chemicals before placing them on the market in accordance with its provision will continue to apply. So, um, if members are, let me just see, Sinead Bradley, then Emma Rogan. Apologies, Chairman, oh. I was just up and asked. You're okay, uh, Emma Rogan. Me too. <laughs> okay. No, that's fine. So if there's no further information or clarification required, then um, we'll indicate that members are content with the proposed statutory rule. Members are agreed. Um, item 10, uh, pages 355 to 382, the department is intending to undertake a 12-week public consultation on increasing the general civil jurisdiction of the county courts in Northern Ireland. This relates to the financial limits which govern the court tier for civil claims such as for personal injury and breach of contract. The consultation paper sets out two main options that the committee will be advised of the outcome of the consultation. Um, so if members are content we'll note the proposed consultation and then we'll consider the matter when the results of that process and proposed way forward are available unless there's any views members wish to submit at this stage otherwise we will uh, noted. Members Agreed. content to note. Okay. Um, item 11. Uh, in September 2020, the UK Government published a response to its consultation on proposed amendments to the Modern <coughs> Slavery Act 2015 and the next steps to strengthen transparency and supply chain arrangements for commercial businesses and for the first time to extend them uh, to apply to the public sector. The Home Office now plans to legislate as soon as parliamentary time allows. This consultation exercise did not extend to Northern Ireland and since then the department has been working with other relevant departments, home office officials, the business sector and other key stakeholders to begin scoping out the impact for commercial businesses uh, and to help shape a public sector consultation paper and a commercial sector engagement paper. Departments intending to undertake a 12-week engagement exercise as soon as practicable after committee consideration to consider it uh, to consider it is in a position to take forward any required LCM in parallel with Home Office legislating for the transparency and supply chain changes. Further information will be provided to the committee following the conclusion of the engagement uh, exercise. So if members are content, we'll just request a, a little bit of clarity as to what the difference is in engagement and consultation which are referred to in this um, particular paper. Um, to identify what that difference is and why then a full public consultation is not being undertaken for both commercial and public sectors. So if we seek that clarity, um, and it may be a straightforward answer, but I think it's worth seeking the clarity around that, then we can um, put it back on the agenda when we have a response, if members are content that we seek that clarity. Okay. Item 12, uh, development and implementation of a statutory registration scheme for legal aid practitioners. At our meeting on the 12th of November last year, committee considered a written update provided by the Department 
On the development of the statutory registration scheme for legal aid practitioners, we agreed to request further information on a range of issues to assist consideration of proposals. The Department has now provided the additional information and indicated that officials wish to brief the Committee in February or March on the post-consultation report prior to publication and to provide further detail on the proposals being developed. The Department has also initiated an engagement with the Law Society, the Bar and the Bar Council and plans to hold the first stakeholder reference group meeting on the proposals in January. The Department intends to undertake a further consultation in mid-2021, which will include outlying plans to provide suppliers with an indication of how the scheme might develop and an opportunity to influence the future direction of the scheme. Also, members, just to note the additional information provided by the Department um, on the development of a statutory registration scheme, um, unless there is any further information or clarity that is uh, required prior to officials attending a meeting to brief the Committee. So, if members are content then uh, to note that, um, and also if you're agreeable, um, can we forward the information provided by the Department on the proposed schemes to the Public Accounts Committee for their information and any comment um, that they may wish to make because this scheme is being developed in response to a PAC recommendation? So, if we can send it to the PAC, members are agreed. Page, yeah. Item 13, Committee Forward Work Programme. The Department has provided a list of items of business that it wants. <coughs> Committee to consider at meetings in February and oral evidence session on the budget has also been scheduled for the meeting of the 4th of February and arrangements are currently being made for oral sessions agreed by the committee last week on the committee uh, reform uh, bill. So if members are content, we will seek to schedule the work items that have been requested by the department for our meetings in February. Uh, also again, just to advise members, there was further guidance provided by the Chairperson's Liaison Group for Committees in light of current ongoing restrictions that set out potential actions for committees uh, to discuss in terms of minimising face-to-face -face interaction and reducing risks at committee meetings. There is guidance at pages 535 of the meeting pack in respect of this, and there is a number of uh, areas and options that are suggested in uh, respect of that. And Obviously, members, um, we have been seeking to try and reduce the length of these meetings, and so far it hasn't been too bad in the month of January, and I, with your help, continue to, to seek trying to do that. So uh, there's guidance there, members, for your information in respect of that matter as well. So the final item um, is just the correspondence. There's 11 items of correspondence, and uh, I'll draw attention just to two of those items. Um, items 7 and 8, their responses from the Department and the Probation Board. Uh, in respect of a copy of their action plan to address the findings and recommendations in the Criminal Justice Inspection Northern Ireland report on the probation practice in Northern Ireland. Uh, at our meeting on the 10th of December, the committee agreed to consider um, getting further uh, information by way of briefings in respect of this issue. Um, so if, if members are content, let us, let us ask um, for a written update on the delivery of the action plan. In uh, in terms of what they're doing in six months' time, we can request that, and then we could schedule an oral briefing if members feel that that's useful. Okay, are members content to action the other items of correspondence as set out in the cover sheet? Uh, unless there's any items members wish to, to comment on, we'll action it as outlined. Members agreed. Agreed. Okay, I don't have any business as chairman. Is there any other business that any member wishes to raise at this point? No other business? Okay, well, thank you. The meeting of the committee then, the next one will be uh, today, week at two o'clock, and that will be in the Senate chamber and via the Starley facilities. So, members, thank you very much for your uh, participation today. Meeting adjourned. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.